what is this thing? Gio should never play for U.S. men's national team again because of the action of his parents. Because- what an idiot! Oh, how a Muppet does this? Muppets. Absolute Muppets. I, I'm not going to be the best person to give a whole explanation here, but that's... Booty, booty, sink, sink. Booty, booty. I can deal with it. What are we really doing? Yeah, yeah. I can agree with that. There are a zebra in between a tarantula and an elephant. Has been nothing more than a sham. So yeah, we didn't play well, but you know what? At the end of the day... We got the job done. It's going to be a good time for sure. Oh, sex with the first cousin would indeed be incest. And- Welcome to the straight red card. Uh, Alexi having to uh, endure the introduction. <laughs> I hope I hope that wasn't too offensive for you. That was well, awesome. That was awesome. <laughs> We'll explain the incest thing in a second. But we want to welcome to the show the one and only, the legend, Alexi Lawless, host of the State of the Union, uh, 1994 denim legend, and uh, the first American, unless there's some Italian-American I don't know about, that played in the Syria before you did. And I don't think there is. I know people have researched it, but I think you were the first. Am I right there? You were the first to play at Padova. I mean, mean, you say it, it sounds cool. So let's go with that. You know, I mean, uh, you know, know, it was before the internet and all that. So good luck on that. Looking it up. (laughs) (laughs) Well, on the pre-show, we cut, we kind of went through the memories, right? Like uh, when we first met, and of course, you're not going to remember that was 2012, and uh, it was the big announcement of BYB. I can't remember what was it, the Co- coaches conference? Yeah, yeah, it was yeah, the convention, right? I think uh, it was out there in, in Indianapolis, and and uh, we had a blast. I went, I can't remember the name of the um, the restaurant that we went to, but it was a wonderful historic type of place that we went to, and I, I'll, I'll remember it later on. But we had a good, we had a really good time, and uh, evidently we uh, met for a little bit briefly uh, o- over there. So it's been a long time since sure. I've been back. Yeah, no, it's 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 been a crazy trip since. I think the first time we asked you to come on the show, or I did, was 2012. Now that was the first version of the show, which was we were the big soccer. Uh, what we called at the time in 2012 and 2011, 2012, a vidcast. So that's, I don't know if that name even holds true now. Um, But yeah, just couldn't ever really find a way to connect with you. Even though we knew a bunch of people that knew you, we just couldn't get a hold of you until, uh, until recently Max came on the show. Max Bredis, he says, I don't know what you guys are worried about. Just have him on the show. He'll come on the show. what, What, what made you come on the show? (laughs) <laughs> I mean, I got up. I got up this morning and I logged on as I do, and uh, you know, I was doing my thing. And I, I, you know, it's all kind of um, like a a slot machine type of thing, and that wherever it just hits, it hits in my timeline. And you guys showed up, and I saw the back and forth or whatever. And to your point about uh, Max Bredos, who I who I love and have a lot of respect for, and have known oh, him for years that. and years and years, and so. Yeah. You know, he gave you the seal of approval and I said, all right, let's do it. And then, you know, we got together and uh, DM'd and all that kind of stuff. And uh, I said, oh, if we're going to do it, let's do it and let's do it now. And to your to your credit, there's other thing, other you know shows that I've done. You have to get it all sorted. And you guys were wonderful in terms of your ability to pivot right then and welcome me on. And so here we are hanging out. So I'm 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 happy to be here. I'm sorry it's taken so many years after that <laughs> first right. ask, but better late than never. Hey, we took a seven-year break in between there, so okay. Yeah, okay. Deal. It was hard. It was a difficult comeback, but here we are. I was going to um, ask you, because, you know, being on X is such a, um, I mean, for a lot of people, I don't think that Brett and I take it as seriously, and maybe you don't either, but how do you deal with that? That's a load of stuff in the inbox every day, including us. Yeah, I, I have... I, uh, publicly, I, I guess I would say I have a love-hate relationship with it because that's what you're supposed to say, right? Be, oh, it's the you know, it's the the scourge of all scourges, and uh, you know, it's addictive and all that kind of stuff. I I approach it for in, in two ways. One is a video game, uh, in that I I enjoy the act of playing X, if you will. Mm-hmm. Uh, but two, and and maybe this is at times more important. Uh, it is an incredible. In, an instantaneous information source. Now I know it's kind of at times a, a glut and just comes at you fast and furious. And you also have to be selective and cull through all the crap out there. But right. I still think it's an incredible source of information, especially for the work that I do. And so I, I do that. The other thing is 
and maybe the final thing is I, I just the way that I'm built. I'm built for interaction. I'm built for discussion. I'm built for debate. I'm built for back and forth. And I think you guys will recognize that in in our sport, we often have too little of that. And maybe too little. Maybe we have it, but we haven't had the platforms necessarily to be able to do it. And we still don't in terms of traditional platforms. So any chance I get to take it, you know, to something like this. And these are conversations, as you know, we've had before in the past at bars and in buses and in hotels and different places out there. But the more of that we can get, we don't have to agree. As a matter of fact, we probably won't agree on, on things. And that's that's OK. But if we can do it in a, a civil and respectful way and 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 one that I think is in, enjoyable in terms of the information that I get, um, I'm always better for it. And so I, I, I enjoy doing things like this. And, and, and X, I think, plays into that. And who knows what 10 years from now that X equivalent will be. Yeah, and like, like Derek said, uh, we don't necessarily take Twitter all that seriously. Um, unfortunately, we don't have any stalkers or people wishing <laughs> us ill will yeah. yet. Um, but that is one <laughs> aspect. That's definitely one aspect of your uh, social media game I appreciate. And I, I think most people, especially in uh, your industry, don't quite grasp when it comes to socials how to handle the naysayers, how to handle the people that you know come out and say, "Hey, I, I, I hope you uh, expire," you know, stuff like that. Oh, they tell you they hate you, like oh, yeah. the yeah. other week, and we were yeah. like, "No, we don't do hate, man. You can't say yeah, hate. Yeah, they hate, they hate just, you. Just, they want you to die. Yeah. They don't like your family. They don't like <laughs> this and that." I mean, I've been I've been doing this a while in terms of being out there publicly, and so I've had people say to my face, behind my back, in print, on telephone, anonymously to my parents, <laughs> to my siblings, to my friends. Um, obviously, online with the whole advent of social media. Now it gives everybody a platform and everybody a bullhorn to be able to do that. And at times also, you know, hiding behind that anonymity and, and in a certain sense, a cowardice that comes with it. Um, but uh, I, I've developed a thick skin over the years. It comes with the territory. Uh, to your point, I don't, I don't necessarily take it very seriously unless it is a, a legitimate threat. And I'm very careful about that. But, mm -hmm. you know, the reality is that if you're going to put yourself out there, you know, people are going to say things and sometimes they're going to say mean things. Sometimes they're going to say things that you might disagree with. And who knows? They don't even sometimes they may call you names and all that kind of stuff. And I, I just I don't I don't function like that. And it, I know it drives my wife crazy um, and it drives others, uh, others crazy. But also it, it creates content and there is an element of of if, if it bleeds, it leads. And I, I may be my worst enemy in terms of giving people a false perception of what the reality is. And while there is plenty of negative stuff that I that I use, um, the vast majority of it is positive. And certainly when I come into human contact, which is the most important contact and interaction, the overall majority of it is, uh, is positive. And people are obviously, we all react very differently in, in what I guess now would be a traditional sense of human human contact and right. interaction as opposed to in front of a keyboard and just sending it out there into the ether. Yeah, I mean, one of the interesting things and one of the things we're trying to do is, uh, for instance, like Max has been on the show a few times, but the last time he came on, it was because, you know, we disagreed about something. Mm -hmm. So we had him on and we, you know, we disagreed, but it doesn't mean we don't love Max. It's and people were saying, Oh, you're you know, you're 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 ridiculing what he's saying. No, 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 no. We're gonna have him on the show. He's gonna get a chance to say, have his say. We did the same thing with Dak um and and uh Filippo. Mm -hmm. And and that's how it should happen. Just because you disagree with somebody doesn't mean you hate them. Sure. And people just need to get over that that whole uh, way of thinking. And it it is unfortunately where we are. Some... And you might just disagree with even sometimes just a part of what I say. You know, I, I do a lot of politics and, uh, you know, obviously that is something that is triggering to a lot of people, you know, especially, you know, being a conservative and being, you know, much more right leaning and especially in a space like American soccer, which, you know, on the surface, and I think it is fair to say does lean heavily left. And so I get a lot of pushback when it comes to that. And I get a, a lot of pushback from people that say, why are you even bringing, bringing this up? Well, you know, especially when it comes to X, this is a personal feed. This is the way that I feel. And again, people can take it or and leave it. They can agree with it. They can disagree with it. They can agree or disagree with parts of it. Um, and there's certain people that say, you know what, I'm done. I'm out. I don't want to hear that. Or this is a, a, a bridge too far. And this is not something that I agree with. And therefore, I'm going to use that specific thing that I disagree with you to blanket everything that you that you are. 
And I wouldn't do that to you. I wouldn't do that to, to others um, because it limits me. It limits the amount of friendships that I can have. It limits the mm-hmm. amount of potential friendships and relationships that I can have out there. Um, and I don't want to do that. I don't want to limit my limit myself simply because I may or may not agree with a certain aspect or a certain topic or a certain thing. As as vehemently as I might disagree with that person, it's still just one thing. And I do think there's so much more common ground out there that people can get to if they do have those conversations out there. Not not everything. Uh, and at times we're going to have to just say we will agree to disagree on this and go on. But we can find a lot of common ground. Out there. This is it's very brave of you, frankly, to do that. And nah, something it's not brave. Come on. Man. Oh, I, come on. In I this talk day about and... soccer on television and I, <laughs> no, I, no, I've no. lived a wonderfully charmed life. And I mean, there's there's much. Bravery is, is has nothing to do with it. It's just hitting, oh, hitting Alexi, sad. I have to disagree because there are literally people now who are disowning their families if they yeah. don't agree. Like, all right, so what did I disown my parents back in the 90s when they voted for Bush Cheney as much as I didn't like Bush Cheney? <laughs> of course I didn't. They're my parents, but that's where we're at now in the discourse. It's it's absolutely ridiculous and yes. abhorrent. So yes. it does take bravery. Like we're chicken shits. We don't come on here and talk about politics. That's right. Why? Because there's 50% of people out there and there's another 50%. Although our beliefs, or at least mine, are extremely complicated. Like it, it isn't as easy as I'm for this side or that side. And you know, in many ways you can actually argue there's a big massive uniparty going on. But enough of that. <laughs> Let's move on with the show. Well, again, Go there, ahead, used, Brett. There, used be, there used to be a time period where you could you could sit down, have friends or uh, in conversations and debates with people who have a different political assignment, and then yeah, have a beer with them next, right? Now, five minutes later, you know, it's not a problem. And yeah. I don't know if, if if it's just the fact that everything's done on the computer, done yeah, on maybe. social media, that you don't have that beer afterwards. That you can. You can you can go back and forth yelling at each other and then you know cheering afterwards you know sure and it's a lot easier to to hit send and say something to somebody on mm-hmm. on the computer or behind a computer uh, with that that shield and that that protection if you will uh, rather than sitting down and looking at somebody and talking to them and saying and saying those things now I'm not saying um, that's not a challenge by the way out there for anybody that I come across <laughs> in public life uh, because as I said before people have come up and you know they've 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 done their thing and said their said their thing the other thing is you know we're talking a lot about X here and it, it applies to most social media out there it is it is while I do get feedback um, you really have to caution on using it as a focus group um, it, it, sure. it, it, it can be an absolute echo chamber. It can give, and it can give you an incredibly warped perception of what the reality is, what you are to that reality that exists out there. And so that, I guess, goes back to part of the, the game and the, and the video game aspect mm-hmm. of it that I that I look at when I get up and I, you know, I hit my morning send of whatever moronic thing that I'm screaming and yelling about. <laughs> yeah, that thing Let's where you're like, good, a little bit. good morning, sunshine. Sometimes I read that. I'm like, man, I don't want to hear about good morning, sunshine. I know, right? What are we yelling about? What are we yelling about? Because that's, it's, you know, that's what it's designed a, for. Yeah, this is a dark day. Uh, I'm a Mike Byers. Thank you for the 199. Let's get this started. Off right, uh, Trump 2024. I guess Mike is uh, swinging that way. And that's fine, oh, Mike. I'm bringing them all in. This is great. <laughs> <laughs> we don't hate you, Mike, for that. We we wouldn't hate you for that, regardless. Jesse Negron for four ninety nine. Alexi, do you do you think on your political views have limited your professional opportunities? That's a good question. Jesse. Well, it's, uh, it is a good question. I can tell you absolutely uh, not li- well limited. I think that I absolutely have missed out on opportunities that had I stayed, you know, quiet. Um, would have been there in that you know you are as a public figure if somebody is going to hire you or um you know have you for an appearance do all these different things they're gonna look at your background any big especially any big corporation they have people to look at your background and they're gonna see this and this is gonna get flagged and then they have to make decisions and i i recognize that there are there are consequences there are consequences to the things that you do and you say and that while you know i think we all agree um, well, I don't know, but I'll speak for you guys, but uh, freedom, freedom of expression, freedom of speech is something is important. And it's a, and it's a huge part of what our country and culture has been, and hopefully is going to continue to be about. It doesn't mean that you are free of consequences in terms of the reactions that people have there. So yeah, uh, to your point, Jesse, first off, thank you for, uh, for that donation on, on, uh, on behalf of the show. Um, yeah, but you know, I'm 53 years old and I can certainly just sit around, be quiet. And what has been 
I guess maddening and saddening to me the most is that we live in a time and an era right now where people are so scared. There was a there was a time to your point earlier where we were all so bold in in the things that we said and we didn't live in a perpetual state of fear of right. saying something because of the backlash because of the reaction. And we live in a world where that backlash and that reaction is immediate and it is uh, hurtful and it is powerful. And I don't blame anybody for not wanting to, to do that. But the problem is, is that again, we get a warped perception of what the reality is out there in terms of what people actually think. And I am denied and we are denied the voices and the opinions, maybe even differing opinions out there that could spin us, could change us, could help evolve us because people aren't free. And that's not even free. Free is not the word, but free mm -hmm. people, people aren't people, like I said, are scared to say yeah. the things that they want to say. And that, that saddens me that we have created a country like, uh, like that. And I know there's people that are listening right now and say, well, if they're so scared to say it, then maybe they shouldn't say it. Maybe it's a bad thing to say. But the reality is of what that line once was and what it is right now, that line has moved dramatically. And I don't think that it's moved in the direction of good. No, definitely not. Uh, we're just not in the same place. Greg Busby for $10. Alexi, biggest U.S. men's national team bust ever. Well, that. That's He's, asking a He's asking a question. He's asking a question. That's interesting. He, he can ask whatever he wants wearing that shirt. Yeah, That's our shirt. He's, He's allowed right. to do so. Man, That's our <laughs> man, right? He's look. He's sporting the garb for you guys. All right, merch, merch. Way to go, Greg. Greg. I like it. We um, love it, Greg. Man, so it would have to be somebody that you know came. And, well, it would have to be. Yeah, Freddie Adu had that one moment in the uh, yeah. the Gold Cup or whatever at the Rose Bowl under under Bob for a little bit. So he did kind of have a moment. But it's uh, it's probably got to be Freddie Freddie Adu in terms. He also of, had he also had six U twenties uh, under his belt. So there's that. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> that, that's <laughs> true. But I think yeah, I think Freddie, you know, because of what what people prognosticated and mm -hmm. and you know extrapolated it out for him for him not to to live up to that. I mean, I don't know if anybody could, but it should be said that you know even Messi's and stuff like that at a very young age they were saying hey this is the next big thing this is a big thing so you can live up to it but not everybody uh, everybody does but yeah there's a, you know Freddie Adu probably is the biggest US men's national team bust i mean there was a point and again it might not be fair but there was a point where people were saying this guy's going to lead us to a world cup a men's world mm -hmm. cup so yeah mm -hmm. yeah no those were and now we've got a 14 year old now out there um, that people are talking about on a regular basis. And they should just keep in mind, before you get on board 100% with a 14-year-old kid named Kevin Sullivan, or Kevin, I don't know what it is, Kevin, Kevin, um, take it easy. Take it easy. We don't know yet. He seems to be extremely talented, but all kinds of things can happen. Injuries, we look yep. at Gideon Zalalem. Like that kid was extremely promising, but his knees took him out. Now he's playing in second division Holland. With Even your Den body, Bond. just just growing your body. I, mean, I don't know about you guys. I, I was a oh. very different body from 14 to 16 to 18. And yeah, and, and especially I was lucky that I, I grew kind of at a consistent pace. Mm -hmm. But we all know about the spurts and the you know the awkwardness and stuff, and that can mess up a, a an athlete as you're trying to function with, I mean, from day to day or week to week, new muscles and muscles that do different things and longer limbs and all this kind of strangeness that is happening in, in your body that you go to that well that served you well, maybe as a 12 year old or a 13 year old or a 14 year old. And then by the way, the rest of the world starts to catch up <coughs> through the, uh, you know, through the uh, puberty uh, age, man. Oh man. It's, it's hard. If you get that thing through that through, and you're still as good, if not a better player, then consider yourself lucky. Yeah. And, and then Freddie really did never really grow no, af right? after the age of 14. So that did not help him. Um, I just want to get the elephant in the room just out of the way because of the, you know, half a million people who saw the, the rant where I lost my freaking shit. And, you know, people clipped out like the 30 second part, didn't provide any context of why I was losing my shit, but they thought it was funny. And I mean, in, apropos, but um, yeah, they're, they're, the context was obviously that I was really upset with the Fox coverage because I was having my brother and my mom and three friends, all casuals, all texting me and saying, hey, where's Pulisic? Is, is, um, 
is Ferreira the best center forward we got? I, he's not that good. I just watched the game. What's going on? Like, who are all these players? Never heard of any of them. I thought you said this team was good. And it was frustrating. Dealing with five people at the same time, texting them all back for providing context, telling what's team B, team C, team D, whatever I was telling them, that I, I, I at the show, I just let it rip. I'm like, this coverage has got to be better. And so that's what I said. Well, uh, Alexi, I don't know what uh, you have to say in response to that, but I figured I'd give you a shot. Well, well, well a couple of things. You know, I, I, I am at a little disadvantage because, you know, I, I have not seen everything that uh, that you guys have done. However, uh, I, I can I can imagine <laughs> what this was. Yes, uh, because you're you're probably not alone in in having a you know a rant. And I look, nobody appreciates a good rant better than I do. Uh, and, you might you know, not appreciate this. Hot one. No, no, I get it. <laughs> nobody and, and nobody get was it. safe. Nobody was safe. No, but even you know <laughs> even even if you are the brunt uh, of said rant, it, it, it's okay. For, first, not that you need me to okay it uh, or anything, sure. and that's not what I'm doing. All right. I'm saying is that. You know, I look at it like we're all in this together, you know, and as as we said earlier, people are going to say good things, bad things. You know, people are going to be critical. People are even going to go what you would consider over the line or anything like that. Eh, it it happens. But I do think um, and I can tell that it comes from a place of passion. OK, so I think it comes from a place of and if it does, it comes from a place of goodness. Whether I agree with it or not is irrelevant. It's whether it comes from a place of passion when it comes to this game. Well, we all have different ideas of what the game should look like on the field, what it should look like off the field. It also comes from a place of performance. Um, you know, we are performing here on this show in that while I like to think that you are getting who I am as a person, there is always going to be a facade. There is always going to be a layer that comes with performing. Okay. Mm. And again, I've made my livelihood in it and I, I love it and I value it. And when I see something that is a good performance, uh, it, it clicks. And obviously the response that you got uh, meant that it, that people appreciated it. It was, <laughs> if, yeah. if it was visceral, then that's okay. It could be visceral, even if it was planned and choreographed. No, no, that's okay. Uh, so this, you know, so this was that. obviously coming just emotionally <laughs> erupting out of you. And sometimes that's, that's great stuff, especially if you can do it in a clear and concise way and one that translates through the screen to people out there. So I, I love it. Uh, I will watch it. I will check it out. I will, <laughs> and maybe I'll have a, a, a return tomorrow or whenever you do the next show. Uh, but you know, the reality is, it, you know, it's, it's, it's fine. I've had plenty of, uh, of those, of those moments. And as far as you critiquing what we at Fox or anybody else does, everybody does, everybody does that. I will say this. We are constantly trying to find the proper balance. And when I say we, it's not just us at Fox. I think it's all of the, the networks that are out there, all the streaming services that are out there, all the performance and, and you know whatever the platform is, tries to find that balance because we all love this sport. We all want different things necessarily. We all believe in different things, how to, how to push it forward. But in order to bring everybody in, in, in together, you know, we, we look at what soccer is, we look at what soccer can be, and we, we have different ideas. And that balance of people that don't know anything, to your point, you know, your family or your friends out there that didn't know what was going on, right. we don't want to stop the bus, okay? But we do want to slow yeah. it down. And I think you will readily admit that over the years, we've got, come a long way, baby, as the saying goes, in that there was a time where we were explaining throw-ins and offside to people. And now we recognize they're going to figure it out eventually. And we're not going to dumb it down for anybody. Right. But we also, to your point, want to make sure that nobody feels left out or nobody feels like they can't follow what is going on. So, for example, this summer we have Copa America and Euros. All right. And there will be times where you're probably rolling your eyes and shaking your head because we are in your estimation, dumbing it down too, too much. And there'll be other times where maybe you're with people and you say, hey, at least you could remind people so they do have that perspective that you're talking about and so they don't look at it and say, well, why isn't Pulisic here? Or why isn't this happening? Or why isn't this team winning? Or why aren't we winning a World Cup? Or why didn't we win Copa America or something like that? Well, there are reasons to that. And that's, that is up to us to provide it. But again, that balance and that shift is constantly going back and forth, that pendulum of where is that right balance between the soccer people who are going to watch no matter what, 
but we do have to have a respect for what they are. And the non-soccer people that are going to come into the tent, especially when it comes to big tournaments and big games and right. making sure that they don't feel left out and excluded because we're talking above them or over them or over them or past them. Well, you're selling a product too. So yeah. if casuals come on and the first thing I guess they hear is, well, this is just their C team um, uh, or B team or whatever you want to call it. Yep. Click. They're gone. <laughs> right. Yeah. So I understand that Funny part. Kids. What? Yeah. And yeah, I did. I kind of lost it. And, I apologize to Stu the week after because, you know, he caught a stray on that one, too. He really did. Yeah, yeah I felt Don't bad apologize about that. to Stu. He's fine. <laughs> <laughs> he has watched it, by the way. I so, mean, he's um, like, he, he's, he's, I mean, he's a, he's a physical Adonis, even with his, uh, you know, his knee thing. And he looks like, you know, uh, a, a a cherub, you know. I mean, don't worry about Stu. <laughs> Stu's gonna be just fine. Hurt his feelings a bit. Come on. Right? Well, yeah. I mean, he wears these skinny suits that fit perfectly, and he's you know, he's jetting off all over the different place. Yeah, Stu's gonna be just fine. He's trying to just like got, him right now, actually. Got that high voice. <laughs> yep. <laughs> all right, Brett. I'll let you start the show now. That was all just the, oh no, one more question before sure. we let Brett start the show. Oh. I told um, you it's gonna be long. Um, the Padova thing. How in God's name? Do you end up in Northern Italy um, after the 90? I mean, there are all kinds of teams all over the world, yet that's where you ended up. I never could figure out, you know, what transpired there for you to end up there. Were they just recruiting you specifically? Was it a contact your agent had? What the yeah. hell happened there? Because that seemed really odd to me yeah, at the so, time. Yeah, in 90, so look, yeah. it's, it's all to do with the 94 World Cup. And I can't believe I, I saw Eric uh, when all the tweeted the other, uh, earlier today about 30 years. And I hadn't really thought about it. But Ugh, I mean, it's yeah. going to be 30 years this summer, which is nuts. We're not doing anything, which is insane. We should, we should probably do something like meet up at a bar, have some drinks or something like that. And I know with 26 <laughs> coming, you know, it's kind of all focused to 26. Anyway, in the summer of 94, the world, I'm talking to you guys because of the summer of 94. I, I tell people all the time, it changed my life forever. I live the power of what a World Cup can, in, can do to an individual. Um, so that was back before the Bosman ruling, it was back before the European community really opened up. And it was back at a time where Syria A uh, was the place to be. All the money, all the prestige, all of the best players, that's where they went. So right. after the World Cup, you know, you get you get seen by a billion people running around and you, you gain a little bit of credibility, even if you're American, uh, and especially if you're American, because you you really need it. And uh, I had so I had three opportunities immediately after the World Cup, starting in the fall of 94. One was in England, one was in Germ uh, Germany, and one was in Italy. So the Bundesliga, EPL, and Serie A. Like I said, there was only one place that I was going. I was going to go to that place. Now, at that time, um, only three players that weren't Italian could actually play at a time on the field. And hmm. so you had to be kind of special. Uh, this was a team uh, in the northern in northern Italy, like you said, that had just come up into Serie A. And, you know, they wanted to make a splash. And here was this guy that everybody had just seen running around in the uh, at the World Cup. And so it was just a perfect synergy type of, type of thing. I had never been to uh, Padova. I had never, uh, you know, I, I'd been to Italy before, but I'd never been there. And it just, there was only one place. I went and visited uh, England, Coventry. I went and visited uh, Bochum in um, in Germany. And then I was down in Italy. And, you know. Well, then that decision's <laughs> easy then. Right, exactly. <laughs> right? So it's easy. Bochum? And, oh, my God. I yeah, mean, but, they, but, if, but if it happened today, you know, the, the EPL would obviously be the draw sure. in terms of uh, mm -hmm. what's, what's going on today. But that's how I found myself in Northern Italy in the uh, fall of 1994 after the World Cup. So are you saying you were not signed to sell jerseys like uh, oh. the American players in Italy today? <laughs> Oh, definitely. Look, this was a curiosity. Uh, and, and, you know, it was this was I will say that when you when you play well in a World Cup, you get a little leeway. All right. Uh, not a lot, not a lot, but a little bit. And so I came in having that cachet of having done well in the World Cup. Um, and that certainly helped. And I, I'll never forget the first night I was there. We were in the uh, in the Italian Alps for preseason. It was not a single player on the team that spoke English. And the only one that spoke a little English, they roomed me with. And the first night I was there, I sat down with Marco Franceschetti and he started uh, to help me conjugate verbs because I was hell bent on learning Italian because oh. I wanted to know what the hell they were saying about me. Yeah. And I wanted, you know, that respect. And again, that other level of respect and saying at least he's trying. And uh, mm. I had some Spanish going in there, which helped a whole lot. 
And I became a better soccer player without a doubt every Sunday playing against the best in the world, getting my ass handed to. And for mm. us, as a little tub that just came up, the only goal was to stay up, which we did that year, which was which was wonderful. Um, but I, you know, I became a better soccer player, but I also became just an incredible, I, I, I just because of the incredible experience, I became a better person too in the language and the culture. And in that fishbowl, what people don't realize is when myself and guys like Kobe Jones were running around on the field in 94, we had never been on the books of a club because of the backwards ass way it all went. Cause all yep. we did was train with the national team for two years leading up to the world cup. And for those of us that were part of the 92 Olympics, we just matriculated up and never actually turned pro and became professionals at clubs. So this was the first time in my life that I was living in the community that I was playing for, you know, going to the, going to the bank and you know, going to the supermarket and people screaming and yelling at you when you did win and people screaming and yelling at you when you didn't win and, and learning right. the language and living that fishbowl life that is the religion when, you know, two things happen on Sunday with soccer and, uh, and, and church in Italy. It's crazy. Yeah, no, that's crazy. Um, having lived abroad myself, I mean, it is an experience that does change you. Um, and uh, I think it's a, an experience everybody should at least try uh, once in their lives. So big, bold move on your part, I think, to make that step. But uh, Cam says for 199, Alexi, can you talk about your time at Emelec? Yeah. So Emelec is a, a team in Ecuador. And uh, let's see, this would have been... Ugh, 1997, Seven, MLS, yeah. MLS had started uh, in 96, so we were in our second year of existence, and uh, we were getting ready for the 98 World Cup, and we were in the off-season of MLS, because we know MLS finishes in the fall, and a lot of us were faced with, and a particular us that were playing for the New England Revolution weren't in the playoffs, were faced with a long period of time where we were not playing. And so the whole con it's not a new concept, but the concept of right. going on loan to keep up with you know fitness and, and just get games was something that uh was you know coming into being. Uh the 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 owner uh, the ownership of Emelec, a crazy, insane <laughs> owner down there, uh <laughs> Got in touch with my agent and said, listen, we'd, we'd love to have him on loan and we'll pay him in dollars and we'll pay him direct deposit <laughs> to, <laughs> to, uh, to your bank in the United wow. States. And I was like, all right, cool. So we got on a plane and we flew down there and I arrived uh, and this and Emelec is in a place called Guayaquil, um, Ecuador. <laughs> and we landed in Quito and the president then picked us up flew us on this plane that must have flown like a thousand feet off the ground the entire time. Oh, you know, it was like hitting trees on the bottom. Anyway, this was this, it, it was not the like Kardashian private jet, but it, but it was a, it was a private and it wasn't even a jet, but anyway, we landed. Yeah, yeah, exactly. This, please, God, don't fail me now in these propellers. Anyway, we landed. He, he takes me into his office, pulls me down and proceeds to give me a lecture for the next hour on the benefits of communism and socialism, reaches <laughs> under his desk and pulls out a uh, Che Guevara watch and gives it to me as a gift and would not start talking again until I had put it on to show him my appreciation. And I'm like, you know, I'm a stranger in a strange land, I'm gonna do whatever whatever he says. So, all right, there we go, off, <laughs> off we go. Um, Sounds like a contradiction just a little bit though. Right, you exactly. Still, you still have the watch? Insane. It was just insane. But <laughs> but it was it was really, really interesting. Guayaquil was an incredible place. Um, the uh, it was during El Nino, hottest place I have ever been in my life. It ended up being flooded water all over the place. And you play down at sea level, crazy El Nino. And then you would go up to Quito and play at altitude. I got I got ejected with, uh, for a red card the first game that I played for the uh, team. And that same president went flying into the referee locker room screaming and yelling about he doesn't understand Spanish because I had just used whatever Spanish I knew and it was <laughs> soccer Spanish and yeah, and they did not take time. Reason. They didn't have the rapport. Oh, yeah. They didn't have the rapport that many of the MLS referees <laughs> like to have. So you were not yeah. even uh, allowed to make eye contact there. So, you know, I was down there wow. for a few months. And again, it was just a, a crazy experience. And the, uh, you know, the wires were, like I said, in dollars and they they landed in my American account and I was happy. There you go. Alexi, did you die in the altitude of Quito? Yeah, yeah, it was brutal. It was brutal. And and obviously, you know, the whole com compare and contrast, because you would be at sea level and then you go to Quito and it's it was crazy. But the Ecuadorians were were wonderful. 
it was a little weird because of the culture and mentality. For example, uh, <laughs> so they call it concentration, right? Uh, which is where you go in as a team uh, getting ready for a game. It's everybody in usually a hotel or something like that. And they call it concentration. But concentration for Emelec at that point was actually built into the stadium. And they were barracks built into the stadium. Mm. And we had a game like on a Saturday. And this is like a Tuesday, Monday or Tuesday. They tell us we're going into concentration for the rest of the week. And I go in and I talk to the referee, I'm, or not, the coach. And I'm like, dude, what, what is going on? He said, listen. I trust you to go home and to be a professional and come back in and train all that. I don't trust my guys. Like I cannot let them out into the world because Jesus. I don't know if they're going to come back. Good they were, God. you know, they were so they were they were insane. And then we would train for like four hours, but of that four hours, there was only actually fifteen or twenty minutes where you were actually doing anything because it was so hot and just such a slow pace, and it was maddening from my perspective. So. Mm. It was a it was a crazy time down there. So good was, question. That's uh, that was that's my Ecuador story. I was gonna make, I was gonna crack the joke of it's, it wasn't some kind of a camp, but uh... yeah, right, exactly. <laughs> it looked it, man. It was concrete and barbed wire and all sorts of stuff there. So yeah, you might have actually regretted that once you got there after yeah, a while. Right, right. Well, yeah, we were down yeah. there. We were like once once we got down, the you know the, the the plane took off. We were like, all right, my my agent took off on me. It was like, all right, that's it. You're on your own. And by the way, Joe Max Moore uh, from the national team and from New England also came down with me down there. So it was nice to have a a guy yeah. down there. That is so right. And I think uh, we had Joe on back in 2011, and we did touch on the Emelec thing, like. For 30 seconds oh but God. uh he did not relate the hell that you just <laughs> the that hellish that. hellish nature of the bunkers that uh, you just talked about well if anybody if you know joe max Moore, he's the most competitive player i've ever played with or against and his his mind i mean mine had a hard time wrapping it around what was going on down there he just could not fathom four hour trainings or players not showing up or not giving, uh, I mean, Joe Max Moore would run through a wall, that proverbial yes. wall for you. Uh, I'll tell you a Joe Max Moore story real quick. Um, he was the last player that got named to the uh, world cup team in 1994, 22 players. Right. And yeah. I, I'll never forget because Bora Milutinovic, our coach told me a story that he was, you know, he was down to the last couple of players who he was going to cut. And Bora was a huge soccer tennis guy. He loved to play soccer tennis. And, Joe Max Moore, like I said, was the most competitive guy ever. And on the last day when he had to make his decisions, he was playing against Joe Max Moore. And he saw how badly Joe Max Moore just wanted to win. Yeah. And he was. I mean, Joe Max Moore would get just completely out of his mind if he lost anything in anywhere. Could be just a stupid, you know, who's going to run to the corner or something stupid like that. And that's what made him Joe Max Moore. But mm. because Bora saw in him this incredible competitive spirit, that's ultimately what was the deciding factor in bringing Joe Max Moore to the 1994 World Cup. Great guy, too. Love yep. him. Um, and, you know, I wonder what he's up to these days. You keep in touch with him? I haven't talked to him in a while. And he is one of the very few from that generation and that team that, I mean, he has been a little bit involved in soccer, but for the most part has done other things and other yeah. businesses out there. Him... Um, Roy Wagerly, but everybody else pretty much is still involved in one way or another with the game. Yeah, yeah. Brett, I untether my uh, the show to you. <laughs> <laughs> we're through the we're through the Derek's portion of the show. Yeah, so. I didn't know that. On was to the actual take, show, guys. Didn't know that was going to take forty <laughs> minutes, but I'm glad it did. It was good forty that was, minutes. That was fun. Yeah. Yeah. Um, all right. Start right. Off, what you start got up right here? Sports Crunch. Hi, folks. I hope you're all feeling well. What do you think is the best soccer city in the USA? I'm not talking about MLS teams, more about soccer culture. Is there a most surprising, most underrated? Ooh, that's a tough one. Yeah, man. This this one gets you into trouble, right? Given well, all the Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I feel, you like, could... I, feel, I feel like the answer is always regional when you when you say something. Because for me, for me, it was always St. Louis. But, but then there's Bethlehem and there, I don't know, New Jersey. Yeah. Sheesh. Yeah, I mean Jersey's, Jersey's you know that there. whole that whole New York metropolitan area is pretty you know I mean, Miola in mind, and all that yeah Carney yeah. and all that kind of stuff. Um, you know, I will say th there is a lot of talk nowadays with what's happened in Atlanta um, and what is going to continue to happen with the National Training Center down there, mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. crowds that they are getting over at uh, uh, in, in Atlanta for Atlanta United and that kind of stuff. 
Um, you know, you got your classics, if you will, up in uh, Cascadia with Seattle and Portland. Believe me, they'll tell you how great they are. Just you don't even have to ask them. <laughs> no, that's true. <laughs> oh, the insufferable in the insufferable Cascadia folks up there. You know, oh, I love yeah. you. You know, I love you. <laughs> but but I mean, you guys, you guys know what is a soccer community anymore? It's 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 there. There's so many that you didn't think were and certainly back in my day weren't looked at like it. I mean, back in my day, it was like Rochester, you know. Yeah. But now there's so many places that, you know, when they finally come up and it could be, you know, they have a MLS team or USL team or an NWSL team or whatever it ends up being, they have a team and they grasp onto it and you see what has been kind of hiding away and been hidden under for, for a while, or it just finally has the opportunity to blossom. And so I, it's hard, it, well, it's hard to, defi to, to find one, but I, my bigger point is that, there are so many soccer markets and so many soccer communities that I never back in the day would associate with soccer. And I love the fact that it is spread like the, the most beautiful virus that you could have out there when it comes to American soccer. And they're all unique in the way that they support their team, in the way they reflect their community, in the way they reflect their history. Um, and that's that's what I love about going to different places and seeing how, yes, the, the thread is this game that we all love. Right. We all take it and kind of paint our own picture. So, I mean, that I'm just to ride on what you're saying there. I'm the same age as you are, Alexi. Okay. And so I know I don't look it. I look about 40 years older than you do, but you've aged better than I, my friend. But I will say this. Actually, you're a year older than me. That's what's even more scary. Um, <laughs> you look great. Stop it. Stop it. Dude. <laughs> um, but, you know, I remember watching the opening, getting back to Cascadia, the first home game at Portland, the first home game at Atlanta, the first Beckham game, all that stuff raised the hair on the back of my neck because I noticed at all of those moments and all those different times, something was changing. And people who are as old as the three of us remember when nobody gave a rat's ass about soccer. No one cared. And it has come such a long ways. And I know we bitch and complain about MLS all the time. And yeah, there's reasons to do that. There's no doubt about it. There are things that, you know, we all would like things to, to be different about. But the fact is, there are a lot of people who just started watching the game in the last four or five years, three years, two years. They're spoiled. Like, they don't know that in 1997, there were soap opera stars playing on the LA Galaxy. All right? <laughs> people don't know that. And it's and and you were a big part of, of course, bringing Beckham here. That was that was a transformational moment, and we've only be, continued to progress. MLS academies, mm -hmm. I mean that that's huge. That's a massive thing. Like everybody's required to have one. There's it's not pay to play for most of the academies. It's not. They're trying to get the best players, and they're you know not requiring you know you to pay for Jimmy to come to your team. So I guess speak to that for a second, because I think there's some perspective we're missing sometimes. Yeah, I part of me says, you know what? I, I don't want them to remember. <laughs> <You> know, <laughs> I, and I don't I don't need them to remember without a doubt. OK, um, however, to your point, if there comes a moment where they're talking out of their ass and they are not talking with a sense of understanding and a sense of of perspective as to how far we have come, it's okay to, to remind people of that. But the fact that there are, you know, young boys and girls that wake up each and every day now in the United States, and to your point, all of these different advantages are offered to them. You know, they live in soccer communities with, uh, with their own professional men's and women's <laughs> team that they can go see. They have all of these wonderful soccer specific stadiums that have come online. They have all these pathways to if they want to play soccer, if they want to work in soccer, all these different things uh, that are happening, all the media platforms that are that are out there that are so much more above ground as opposed to underground, you know, back uh, back in our day. That's all that's all a good thing. And that this generation now wakes up and they don't know a time where it wasn't like that. I look at that as progress and I look at that with a sense uh, with a sense of pride. But we have come a long way and undeniably we have come a long way. I mean, I can tell you, I know exactly where I was when I walked into a bar 
in what would have been uh, like 98 ish, right? So a couple of years into MLS, I would have been, you know, playing maybe for, uh, well, I mean, 97 or 98. And I walked into the bar after our game and I looked up on the television and there was a soccer game. And I thought that it was a game being televised from Europe. And then my double take, I turned around and it was the opening game in what now is <laughs> old Ohio Stadium, uh, Crew Stadium. Hmm. But at that point, that was state of the art. That was the mm -hmm. next, the, the, you know, the next generation, the, the next frontier of soccer specific stadium. Now it's obsolete and they've moved on to an even bigger and better 2.0 type of thing. We could not have envisioned what MLS would have been, what soccer would have been on and off the field back then. All of that is to say is that it has changed dramatically. And that is not a reason to rest on our laurels. It's also not a reason, to your point, not to point out when things are wrong and things need to be better and warranted criticism on and off the field of things that we are doing. And I guess there's nothing more American than expecting more and not settling for anything and certainly not settling for less and wanting to be the best. And I don't think that that's necessarily American exceptionalism. And if it is, I think it's in the most positive sense of doing things that people believe that we as a country cannot do. And when it comes to soccer, there's a lot of the world that believes no, no matter what we do, we're not going to ever be on par with the rest of the world. Well, there's plenty of things that I can argue that are. There's plenty of things that I can argue in terms of the progress that we've made that if you, again, if you extrapolate it out, it's, un, it's unprecedented. And we're all doing it in a very, very unique country and culture, given the fact that soccer isn't king and, and given the fact that we don't have, uh, that we have so many other competitors, if you will, with a whole lot more history when it comes to our professional sports out there. Yeah, no, yeah. amen. Although every once in a while, I do like to wake up in the morning and open my front door and go, get off my lawn. <laughs> I was going to say, it, is, it was absolutely our, our, our old man yells at cloud moment where we would sit back and say like, I remember back in the day when, you know, people would make fun of us and call it, there are soccer's for girls and oh, uh, yeah, yeah, derogatory yeah. terms and communists and, and all that yeah. kind of stuff. Oh, yeah, we've, yeah. All, we've all been there. We've yeah. all been and now, you know, now my son has access to watching EPL, uh, Syria, La Liga, Bundesliga. Um, you know all the all the leagues, yep. except for except for league because uh, I'm not going to get being sports. So <laughs> yeah, that's the only league I don't watch because I'm not getting being sports. But uh, no. and and you know we only got what Sabi and of course you know we got Flow there too. That's important. But you know I just catch the highlights. Yeah, if they do something, we'll hear about it. Mm -hmm. Right, exactly. <laughs> what do you got next, Brett? <laughs> uh, anybody catch the uh, the Chelsea Everton game? Oh yeah, yeah, that was embarrassing. Is that what you got? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, there's a uh they're already up 4 0 at this point. They're take they're got a PK and they're fighting over the ball. Do you ever experience anything like this, Alexi? I mean, so this, this, this is four, this is four nothing, right? This is at four, four nothing. nothing. Oh yeah, God. and Palmer already has a hat trick. Hey man, you know, greed is good, I guess, <laughs> to quote Gordon Gecko. Um oh! but, it, but it can also be a bad look out there, you know. It sure I mean, as hell it, is. Yeah. The game is over, you've you've won, and now what are you what are you fighting for? Like I, I will say, and I don't know how the players are, are made up now, but you know, scoring the goal that wins the game, th there is a much greater value than scoring, I guess, in this instance, it would be the fifth. Of what ended up being six. Nothing. Yeah, it's a fluff goal. So uh, I don't know what's going on. But there's, there's another part of me that likes the ruthlessness and likes the greediness of players to want to just score no matter what the circumstances are. And I suppose if you're if you're playing with somebody that just again a Joe Max Moore type that thinks about things in a different way, if you learn to harness that, you know, if I'm on that team, I'm probably saying like I can scream and yell about it, but this is just the way that he's wired. And I want that wiring on my team, especially when it gets down to a game that actually matters. Not that Chelsea has you know, been great this year by any stretch of the imagination. But right. when yeah. it comes to the amount of goals they scored, they probably would have been better off if they had just taken one nothing and then they could have spread out those other <laughs> spread five. It out of it, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> would have been, they would have been contenders if they took this game and just spread it out over across the season. Right, I, exactly. I think it shows a little <laughs> bit of this sort of reflection of where Chelsea is in general, though. Mm -hmm. This is a lack of leadership. Because you see uh, Gallagher there, and he 
he's having a rough time holding these guys well, back. And uh, I guess I guess Palmer is the uh, designated PK taker. Yes, yeah, he is. A couple people, so I don't know. But I, don't I mean, pull, I don't Chelsea anymore because why would I? But Cole, at this point, having a hat trick, he could say, you know, who really needs yeah. a goal? This guy needs a goal because he hasn't scored yeah. for a while. So let this guy have a taste of it. I don't know, and I don't care because I don't like Chelsea. You know, since since Pulisic <laughs> left, I could give two craps about Chelsea. I mean, we still got Gaga there, but he's not necessarily. No, there. he's he's at Oipen, and he's never going to play. For, he's probably not going to play for Chelsea more than likely. That's I mean, in in the best of possible worlds, he will, but that's not how the world works. Well, I mean, we'll he see. joins a, a list of Americans that have been on quote Chelsea, but not yeah. actually right. Yeah, exactly. uh, Miazga <laughs> or whatever. Yeah. Chelsea yeah, loan Miazga. army. Yeah, yep. yeah, and they have the biggest <laughs> loan army uh, in yeah. uh, in the EPL. So, yep. what else you got, Brett? Bada ba boom. Uh, uh, so Spencer here, uh, you know, he does a lot of uh, analytics, uh, statistics. Okay. Uh, and he did some stuff uh, covering uh, Johnny Cardoso. So I wanted to uh, not necessarily look at what he covered, but this is just for fun. Okay. You should take a look at his uh, his uh, stats here. So, I mean, he, he's talking about some stuff. But this is what it came out to. Oh, my. <laughs> what? What, are, what, are, what are the odds? <laughs> is that real? Is that really how yes. it came out? Because he, he, he even says right here, he goes, uh, yes, I'm aware of the shape his profile makes on his ra radar chart. So, I mean, come on. Oh, Jesus. Well, <laughs> hey, listen, uh, you know, whatever this chart says or doesn't say, um, the reality is that Johnny's got to find a way to translate what's going on right now from a, from a national team perspective oh, with the goodness. national team, because yes. this, this has been a wonderful move for him from a club perspective. And this change of scenery has, I think brought out the best in him, but we have, we have still yet to see it really flourish on the national team. And I, I, I agree with my friend, Dave, not argue, but we discuss um, Johnny Cardoso with uh, Mossy, my, oh, David, David Mossy, my, yeah, uh, my you, partner you in on the State of the Union. He's awesome. He's just just a wonderful human being and just a, a pleasure to to call him a friend and to work with him as a colleague. Um, but, you know, he he is absolutely of the opinion that it hasn't quite translated when it comes to the national team. And this happens. This has some, happens to some players. And it doesn't mm -hmm. mean that it can't going forward. But that change of scenery um, into the national team, it is very, very different and just because it's happening just because it's happening in, in a positive way or a negative way doesn't mean that it automatically translates to the national team until you get there different set of circumstances obviously different players sometimes different formations different tactics all that all that kind yeah. of stuff so we'll, yeah. we'll see but this is a good thing all things being equal mm -hmm. yes you want your players playing you want your players playing well and then hopefully they can translate that into the national team and he's I mean, a very very different player than what we've seen in the past yeah Club i mean wise. he he does provide another dimension. I mean, obviously, yep. the holding midfielder um, role he plays at B B Real Betis is different than what often Greg asks the CDM to do for the United States. So we'll see how it translates. But it does give Greg another, I don't know, whatever you want to put, another tool in the bag if you want it you and, know. and tyler's been out again you know tyler got is mm -hmm. hurt still again with uh you know back this uh, this chronic back spasm type of thing that's going mm -hmm. on we don't know how long is that so having depth and having different options you know whether it's a, a straight comp or not it really doesn't matter but having different ways to fill that midfield because you know musa did not have a good uh a good window and so there could be opportunities out there as you know this race to not just this summer, but then the ultimate race to 26, uh, 26 happens for personnel. Is Musa hitting a ceiling? Because, I mean, I watch him. I, I, I'm watching him at AC Milan, and uh, he still does all the things you expect him to do. He carries the ball very well. It's like glue stuck to his foot when he runs. But I just, I'm just waiting for another step to happen, and I haven't seen it happen even from the move from Valencia to AC Milan. I'm still seeing mostly the same player. Maybe a little bit more smart, but still just not seeing all of the field. I don't know. Has he he's stagnated? The, he's the opposite effect, right? He's the opposite effect in that I think his national team performances, mm -hmm. notwithstanding the fact that he wasn't great this last window, but I think he's been better with the U.S. national team than he has been with with club, and certainly now with what's going with what's going on. Uh, to your point about whether he's hit a ceiling, 
I think there is an argument to be made because you know we saw this, we saw a lot of these guys, and they were kids. Some of them were right. teenagers, including him. And so we said, well, if this is what he's doing now, think of what he'll be when he's you know 22 and 23 or 24 when he gets into the prime of his career. But you yeah. got to start seeing some progression. You have to start seeing some some evolution, and it's hard when you're not playing uh, playing consistently. I, I still think that there's something there. And to your point. You know, that explosiveness that we marveled at from the national team at times when, you know, he would break through different uh, different lines of, of players with this this I guess it was strange types of explosiveness. But it was mm. awesome to see. Right. Because yeah. it, it kind of came out of nowhere. He would just be kind of doing his thing in this rhythmic type of play. And then, boom. And once he broke through. He's leaving two and three players behind. So now it opens up for every, everybody else. And that's so valuable. If he can continue to do that, I, I don't really care what's happening at the uh, mm -hmm. at his club situation. And I look at a lot of these players through my red, white, and blue colored glasses, and <laughs> and that's okay. I think a lot of people do, uh, you know, yeah. unless you're a you know a, a Milan fan or a Juventus yeah. fan or you know the, the list goes on, goes on and on. But I just look at it right. from a U.S. national team perspective. But I am worried that if this is the ceiling, is this good enough? Uh, or are there others that are coming along within this national team? And that's the thing I was thinking about today, Derek. I'd be interested to get your, your thoughts in that this team was built around this group, right? This generation. We'll call it a golden generation, whatever it is. But it was built around all these teenagers. And if it's not a golden generation, then shouldn't there be a whole other group of teenagers that are coming up and not only making mm. their case, but sensing and smelling when there is um, vulnerability like a Musa, like anybody else, yeah. I, or is Greg, and I know you guys want to talk about Greg here in a second, yeah, we're or is Greg just, this is my group. These are my guys. This is my generation. I know them. I trust them. And it's going to take a whole lot for somebody coming up behind to actually jump into it. And, and I'll finish it with this, that group that, you know, I mentioned Joe Max Moore, but it includes Friedel and Lapper and Kobe, and the list goes on and on. We all matriculated out of that generation of the 92 Barcelona Olympics, and it was by design, which is why I'm really excited to see the Olympic team this summer. If, right. pe if some of these players can make a name and can push, there should be no sacred cows when it comes to this group of national team players. And I hope that there aren't going forward over these next couple of years. And I do think that things will change and there might be vulnerabilities and might be opportunities. I mean, I, I really hope there isn't another what I Brett and I refer to as the Breck Shea black hole generation, <laughs> which, you know, that's why we ended up playing with an 18 year old trying to qualify for the 2018 uh, World Cup and a bunch of 30 year olds because all the guys from age 25 to 27 to 28 that should have been there outside of Jeff Cameron, who didn't even play, and maybe a small handful of others, that generation had a, uh, I don't know, I'm not going to say they're all horrible that there, there was a, a gap there and i don't want to see that gap but right now to speak to what you're saying and we track this endlessly there are some great younger players out there i, I think of max Dietz at great the i think there are but you can't say for sure that those players are going to work out mm -hmm. you can't say they're not polisic they're not arena they're not they're not already in their teens and being successful. Mm -hmm. Some of these guys are in their young twenties and they're still playing in Bundesliga two, or they're still struggling to start. So we don't know where that next generation is going to come from, which is what makes covering the sports. So absolutely insane. Cause we're often asked like, why don't you bring on an expert to talk about youth? It's like, bring on an expert. Like I've been tracking these guys. I've been tracking youth players for 20 years. And there's no such thing as an expert. I learned my lesson with Gideon Zalalem and so many other players. Do not bank on you what you think is a bankable player because you just don't know what's going to happen. So I guess we're going to just get to see how this evolves. We got and such a long-term use of uh, certain players coming up here. Like we got Pulisic, you know, Gio's uh, coming through. Um, obviously, you got Wes and stuff like that. The big problem is that the obviously the teens now – aren't going to outshine them per se, but what we're going to start seeing is we're going to start seeing that average age that's going to the World <coughs> Cup is going to start creeping up a little bit higher because then you're going to start having the aged players like the Polisics and the Weyas and the um, McKinney's and stuff like that. But you're also going to have some younger players into the woodwork. 
So it's not, I don't, I don't, yeah, we hope, yes. But you, you have players like Paredes that's out there. I mean, Gio, hell, what's, what's Gio at this point? Like 21, 22, at this, you know? I mean, he's one of the younger examples of the group. So but there, yeah. I mean, there, there are there are young players coming through. There's just no, I would argue, you'd say no starlets like you'd see with like Pulisic or, or Gio who are playing at the age of 16, 17 over at Dorbin. Right. We, we don't quite have that yet, but we may have a, a, a swath of young players that, you know, are, are capable of playing. And as they're getting into their early 20s, mid 20s, they're going to add more depth and maybe even start shining at that point. Yeah. I mean, we have that 19 year old that plays at Dortmund's U 19s and he scored a goal in a youth tournament. And everybody was like, cap him now. Holy <laughs> crap. Cap him now. It's like this guy is 19. What was Polisic doing at Dortmund at the age of 19? All right. Or 18. You know, so he's not a starlet. He hasn't even made the Dortmund 2 team. There's no reason to break out the loop here. Let's all calm down and, and just let this kid develop. And But there are no starlets, I think, I think mm-hmm. is the point, right? Okay. All right. Is that fair? I mean, yeah, are I th- they? I th- am I missing I like, something? No, <laughs> I, I, I think it's completely fair. I think, you know, and I'm, I'm Brett Tizier, uh, you said you have a son? Yeah. How, how old is he? He's nine. He's nine. Does he play? Yeah. He's, he's he's still playing rec, obviously. It's not quite yeah, yeah, the yeah, level, but he's he's really interested in sport. He's got he, he's bugging me all the time. He's like telling me stats of uh Ronaldo Cristiano Ronaldo is his favorite player. <laughs> and the <laughs> sad thing is every time he plays for a, uh, a club, he always goes, Who's your favorite? Do you like Messi or do you like Ronaldo? And everybody's like, I like Messi. And he's like, No, you're wrong. <laughs> I love it though. I love that he's having these having I, I you know, I Mossy and I talk about development a little bit because I'll be honest with you, it it doesn't interest me in that I, I don't find it entertaining and interesting to talk about. I recognize the value and the importance. And obviously it is creating some of these players that I'm talking about mm-hmm. possibly come uh, coming up. But, you know, we, we we talk about, you know, what the American development system is, what it isn't. You know, again, I guess this is more grumpy old manning type of thing in, in all of the different opportunities that, you know, your son and every, you know, the, all the sons and daughters out there now have that you know that we never grew up with and you know whether it's the infrastructure that exists just literally fields to play on whether it's the coaching level that exists and you know back in my day it was my dad my dad was a professor but he was a greek professor and so (laughs) evidently he was an expert on soccer that's how (laughs) that's how he that's how he became my coach at a young age Mm. didn't know a goddamn thing about soccer okay but you know, he, he spoke with a Greek accent and, uh, you know, so that's fine. Good, the Greek must know right. about soccer. Yeah. We've, we've, we've moved well <laughs> beyond that. And, and that's a, that's a good way. And that's nothing against newbies when it comes to coaches out there. And if there are any out there, God bless you, uh, whether you're parents or whether you're just volunteering your, your time, we need as much of that. But the knowledge of the game has increased as the, as the game has improved out there. And that transfers on this generation at a much earlier age. They have, like I said, better coaching, better facilities, uh, and better opportunities uh, going forward. So whether your son continues on or not, my son is, I have a, I have teenagers and they've played AYSO for as long as I can remember They're, you know, they're not going to go on and be professional soccer players or anything like that, but they have soccer in their lives. And mm-hmm. that's a good thing to me beyond yeah. the actual kicking of the ball, all of the, you know, the social lessons that you learn and the skills that you develop physically, uh, the interaction that you have, the friendships that you make, the experiences that you have, all that kind of stuff that doesn't just come from soccer, comes from sports. It's so important that we're having that. So um, I know it's a little tangent of what we were talking about there because we obviously talk about the elite and we talk about the highest level when we talk about these, these players. But there's a whole generation now that is so much bigger than it ever was that is getting soccer as part of their life. And I think that's a, I think that's a good thing. Sports in general, I think is a good thing, but the fact that it is soccer now that is guiding them and is giving them those experiences and those tools that they can use, it warms the cockles of my redheaded American heart because we concentrate so much on that 90 minutes when they're running around the field. But the reality is that other 22 and a half hours, that's what makes them the young men and women that are going to lead what I feel is the greatest country in the world. Speaking of cockles, Best Greek, <laughs> best Greek soccer name, Harold, aka Harry Paratestes. Best, <laughs> best Greek soccer name ever. Well, <laughs> right. To your to your point, Alexi, the uh, the players who uh, play YSO or play rec or play travel, even um, that won't amount to a professional player by all means. That's how you really develop cultures. You get players who are really interested in the sport itself. They may not necessarily be professionals, 
99.99% of them won't sure. be. We weren't. Uh, I mean, yeah. I mean, heck, look, look, look at using uh, American football as an example. How many people in the stadiums watching those games, how many people watching them on TV were actually professional football players? Yep. A very, 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 very. But it's a cultural thing, like you said. So, yeah, yeah, they, they that's grew up watching. That's how you're going to grow. They have I mean, the sensory, the recall of, you know, this is what I did with my parents and this is what I did with my friends and this mm -hmm. is it and the tailgating and the and the the ritual, uh, you know, and the, and the tribal nature of it, all that kind of stuff is is wonderful. And, and to your point, it's happening with soccer. That's a good thing. And to be fair to Brett and myself, I guess, but both of us very good high school soccer players in our day, we both went to IU. So the chances of us making the IU soccer team. I wish I would at least tried out, played for the practice team or something. I, it, hindsight's twenty twenty, but at that point, I was like, I just want to go and enjoy college. I have a uh, I have a letter somewhere from uh, uh, Jerry Agley. great guy, um, by the way, um, that says. Uh, we have examined your, uh, your interest, but we feel that you should concentrate on Division II schools. This was oh, oh, Jerry! No, I just I've met him. I, you know, I've hung out with him over the years, and we've had we've had drinks and laughed uh, laughed about it. Well, uh, you know, but one that got away, if, uh, one that got away, if you will. But I had I had very little coming out of high school. I grew up in uh, the suburbs of Detroit. And coming out of high school, it was before YouTube, it was before anything. Anybody, mm -hmm. there was no recruiting or anything like that. Um, I had, I was, you know, I was getting rejected everywhere. And Weird. Rutgers University was the application back then. We actually had applications, and uh, mm -hmm. it was underneath all this stack of applications. The only reason that I had sent away for it was because I had read Soccer America and I had seen Peter Vermes had played for Rutgers, uh, Rutgers University, and I had never been there i didn't even know where it was never been to new jersey or exit nine off the turnpike or anything like that so and once uh you know once once i got in i was like yeah it's the only place that let me in so let's do it and my dad drove me out the 16 hours from detroit and dropped my ass off right there off the, the turnpike at exit nine and the rest is history did you ever end up playing iu i don't i don't think so well Rutgers no, wasn't in the Big Ten then, so no, you I, don't, I, I don't think so. Yeah, but so I, that... I do, I do remember having a, a fun conversation with uh, with the eggs <laughs> about uh, all that. And God, what a legend! And 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 again, you don't, you don't know. To your point, a lot of these young kids, you know, if I was growing up in that time, you know, I probably if if or if I was growing up in this time now, you know, you would have been identified early. And you would have been moved along. You'd probably be involved in a, you know, some sort of development academy here situation there. You might be bypassing the college pathway, which is a mm -hmm. lot, what a lot of players do now. So it's just a very, very different time and a very, very different setup um, that has that we have that we have created. And it's not, you know, I guess it's better from a pure soccer standpoint. I don't know if it's ultimately better in terms of uh, are we abdicating our responsibility to produce better people as opposed to just better soccer players? But that's a conversation for another day. Well, yeah, because you can argue, does college make better people anymore? I don't know. Used yeah, to. exactly. Used to in my day. I mean, exactly. I came out partied and exhausted and, right. you know, hungover, but I still learned a bunch of stuff, yeah. too. So, and you, um, and you And you, for the first time, I would think, also were given – added responsibility and autonomy and yes you, know, you had to learn how to wash my own clothes it's right you weird. had to you had to figure it out now it was a, in a controlled setting but you know mm -hmm. you still had to kind of figure it out and yeah. meet new people and you know i, I mean, listen i for the for the jersey kids that i showed up you know at at Rutgers, the thirty thousand people at a state school there and i went to a little prep school in michigan I was from the other side of the moon, basically. <laughs> they had mm. never, they, they, Michigan was like, oh my God, where is that? That's that's way the hell gone. And I, I kept my mouth shut for the first <laughs> month that I was on campus. I didn't say anything to anybody and just scared the crap out of them. You know, this redheaded kid from Michigan that doesn't say a word and just kicks anything that moves. I told the, I told the coach that, uh, that I played sweeper because they were going for a rebuilding year. And I, he goes, you ever play in the back? I said, yeah, of course. Never played the back in my life. And so I just <laughs> fake it till you make it. And back then yeah. you could, you could not only kick things. I mean, you had to like have protruding bone to even get a yellow card and you can get a yellow card every yeah. single game. Yeah. And I was like, this is all I have to do is run around and, you know, practically decapitate people on oh, the field. All right, gosh. sign me up. This is what yeah. it is. I think people um, today, uh, students today have actually worse geography. So 
I was kind of surprised you said they didn't know where Michigan was because, I mean, I think a lot of people knew the basic maps back in our days, but now nobody knows where anything is. It's kind of I crazy. know, right? I mean, we had they actual capitalists on road trips and click tick and all that kind of stuff. And, yeah, yeah. Amazing. I just went on your phone like, I got to go to this place. Okay. Right? I, I grew up with a globe. I knew every country in the world. What do you got next, Brett? This is, as I'm pulling this up real quick, I will say, like, my wife is horrible with directions and it's if it's something if there's ever a bit of road construction she freaks out breaks down pulls over has to give me a call i'm just like just go to the next road turn around go there you know it's just does she use does she use ways or anything like i mean it's, she uh, doesn't she does yeah um okay, good. but i mean yeah this, but if something like today where there were all the protests and the uh yeah. and the and the bridge gets closed or something oh, like that, that's gonna throw yeah. her out of whack <laughs> I wonder at what point people are going to realize those kind of protests don't work. Like, don't mm. protest that that affects, like, the average working Joe. You want to go protest? Go protest at whatever corporation or whatever is, you know, su building. supporting whatever. the crap that you're against. Go protest and irritate them. Don't yeah. protest against average Joe because that's going to turn average Joe against you, and you don't want that. I mean, if you want somebody to actually – decide that your your cause is important that's a little politics there all right um artium drag stop our artium artium drag stop is that like a no i haven't seen this no, guy it it, it, it's, it's, yeah he's in, he's in the chat a lot he's not it, a he's not a trick name he's not trying to get you derek okay uh i always wonder we, all right we have, we have a thing going on with all of our live streams and stuff like that, where people will super chat us with names, you know, the typical like Seymour butts, etc. But we're, <laughs> we're always watching others aren't. No. And we're okay. If we say it, yeah, it's we all right. Care. We laugh. It's, <laughs> it's funny. Well, uh, for $2, he says, is there any time left to replace the U S men's national team coach? I guess that's leading us into this conversation. Um, oh, and perfect, Brad, because this is the one thing that, uh, so I was, we were talking about Greg and his rehiring, and mm -hmm. we, of course, we did a whole show on the whole Reina thing. And the the whole, I mean, we had get all the information. We've had guests that were there, blah blah blah, and told us about the situation. So we had it all. When we laid it out, we made a timeline, blah 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 blah. blah. And that's re regardless of all that. Um, I was with you, Alexi, when you said. Well you, you were a card carrying member of the one club, one cycle club for a while. So were you. I so am. were you, I'm the Brett. President. I'm, the, I'm the president. One cycle. One, yeah. You were the president, the president of, one, of the club. One yeah. cycle and you're gone. And I thought, you know, why did you make the exception for Greg? Because I found like that's you breaking your own principle. It is. And I realized that Greg was kind of screwed over a little bit by the phone call by you know Raina's mom and that was really atrocious and what they did was absolutely horrible but why not stick to just your basic four years and done or one cycle and done why make the exception in this case precisely because of the way that you described it in that i didn't want him not to be given the opportunity because of what happened uh to your point yeah i i believe that it can get stale i believe that one cycle is enough i believe that you are a caretaker and that hopefully you hand it off after that cycle in better shape than when you took it over like anything else you know presidency or anything anything else right going forward um the situation that happened obviously was unique and was rare and i thought was you know ultimately pretty 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 wrong and despicable um in the way that it all came down had and you know by all accounts the united states soccer federation was ready to sign him and continue on okay and while i have made it very very clear that i didn't want two cycles and i would have disagreed <coughs> with that it's ultimately their decision and i didn't want what happened to take precedence i didn't want ha what happened to have that power over his opportunity and that's how that's how I justified it uh, justified it to myself. Now, in doing that, have they made a decision that ultimately is going to, you know, uh, fail or is not going to give us the best chance going forward? Whether it's this summer or more importantly in twenty twenty six, yeah, yeah, maybe. And so I guess this all comes back to what happened after that World Cup. And if that hadn't happened. Then I would have continued. Would have continued on, but the federation wanted to continue on with him, and 
I don't want him or anybody else for that matter to be denied that opportunity based on what I thought was, was, was wrong ultimately and sorted stuff that had nothing to do ultimately with him as a coach. Well, here's how I saw it. I said, yeah, that was really wrong. What Mrs. Raina did was bad. Uh, the phone call, obviously bad. Um, and it was negative. Obviously, it was atrocious. But I was like, but I'm still sticking to it. Four years and done. One cycle, done. Um, I, I felt bad that that all had to come out. I, had, I felt horrible that we're going back 30 years talking about, you know, whatever happened after a night of drinking, which wasn't good. It was bad. That was bad, too. But I think they're married now. We They've moved on, obviously. It's horrible that they had that had to be come out and become public. And uh, but I, I I stuck with the guns mm -hmm. and I think Brett did, too. And I, I we thought well, you kind of like uh, betrayed us. There yeah. A bit. yeah, yeah, I get <laughs> it. I get what, it. What, Listen, what, what yeah. do you what do you said uh, that he should be rehired or you or you alluded to it? The fact that he should be rehired. It made it sound like you're you went from being a one cycle, then this incident occurred, and you're like, okay, well, I want Greg now. That's what it, that's what it kind of. Oh sounded yeah, yeah, like yeah. It was. It, I became very, I guess, positive or proactive in that. Now I want you to hire him <laughs> because I was so incensed by what happened. Yeah. Like, like honestly, I was I was ready. Okay, done. We'll move it on. That's uh, that's great. You know, it, it it was an okay World Cup. Um, you know, you can see progress and stuff like that. All right, we're moving on. Fine. No problem. Greg can go and do, do his thing. And then the shit hit the fan and we're back to a, a situation where, again, I wouldn't want you. Or, and I also, while, while I like Greg and I think he's a good coach, even if I didn't like Greg or I didn't think he was a good coach, I wouldn't want somebody, you know, I, again, to, to be tarnished like that and to miss out on an opportunity, even somebody that I didn't, that I didn't like. And so, yeah. It became it became much more of a, I guess a, a a moral stand, if you will, and maybe a little righteous in 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 what I was what I was saying. But you know, I just it had nothing to do necessarily even with kicking a ball. And maybe again, that's detrimental ultimately to what everybody wants, which is a good soccer team that wins games and hopefully at some point wins a men's wins a men's World Cup. But sure. in this case, I, I I looked at it as there's things that are more important, and the um, the opportunity that was there for him, I wouldn't want that taken away from me or you because of, uh, because of what happened. And, you know, the, the past type of thing that was, that was brought up just rubbed me the wrong way. No, I, mean, I get, go ahead, Brett. I was going to say hindsight's always 2020. And we know now that there was, there have been multiple sources have come out and said that U S soccer was always planning on rehiring regardless of the investigation. Right. Um, um, but I mean, I guess, I guess my stance on the whole thing would have been, Regardless of how horrible the incident would have occurred, and you know, you'd say, "Hey, I hope this doesn't necessarily, you know, take away an opportunity." But I'm still a one cycle purist here, so I don't know. I would, I hey, would, listen, I would you, you might get you might get a right cycle there, and a half here too. I mean, to Artem's <laughs> to Artem's question down there, uh, you know, look, this I, I do think that if it goes poorly this summer that there is absolute cause for a change to be made, and maybe the last the last time that you can really, I guess maybe, maybe not, but maybe the last time legitimately that you can make it two years before the world cup, obviously within a summer where there will be opportunities, there will be names out there maybe, and there will be, who knows, maybe what you consider upgrades uh, going forward. Now I do think it has to be an unmitigated failure this summer. And what the definition of that, everybody has, everybody has their, uh, you know, has their own idea of what that is, but, it, it, I, I don't think it's beyond the pale and I don't think it's unfair to, you know, I had Greg on the state of the union and that was the first question I asked him is, does your job hinge on what happens this summer? You know, and he, he, he hemmed and hawed, but I think he does recognize that he as an individual needs to have a good summer. And obviously it's completely relative to how his team does in this Copa America. And this is a team that's not going to have to go through qualifying. This is the last real time that we're going to see them. They might schedule something going forward, but in a legitimate, it's the closest thing we're going to see to a World Cup, given the size and given the quality that they've come up against. And so I think it's completely fair for us to expect something that we haven't seen before that justifies, you know, take away my justification for him continuing on. But your justification 
if there is one, it's that, all right, well, then we should see something better and we should improve. And we should see that this summer. I think that's fair to expect. Yeah. So a couple things here. Um, number one, you had Greg on. You were one of the first people after Greg was hired. You had him on your show. And you were two-part question here. And you were talking about, well, as Greg went through what he described as his system. And then you asked him, and you were the one of the first to ask him, are you willing to be flexible with that system? Because this is not a club team. Good question. Um, number two, who is Greg? Like, I know you guys, when he does your show, you guys go out to have dinner and whatever. But it's really hard to figure out who Greg is. I know we've had lots of journalists on our show who have interviewed Greg. And I'm not going to mention their names because it's usually after the broadcast. And they're just like, he's just weird. I don't know. He's just a weird guy. I can't figure him out. Um, so two-part question. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, I, 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 I mean, I think he is quirky, uh, and I've known him. You know, we played together, so we've been around for a while. Um, I don't think, certainly when he started with the national team, I don't think that he was comfortable in a traditional way in front of the camera with the amount of attention that he got, or really kind of just laying out what his philosophy is. And you know, this is a high-profile type of job. This is one where you are going to, I mean, not to the level of other national team coaches, but you're still going to be asked to be in front of a camera and talk about things. And we know your, your aesthetic, the way that you, you know, comport yourself is going to be judged as much as the X's and O's and as much as the wins and losses uh, out there. I think he's gotten a lot better. To your point about, you know, what his philosophy is and what he wants to do, that's where I think he has changed. And I think for the better in that I think that when he first started, he was a real true believer and he fought against being pragmatic because I think in his mind, it betrayed what he wanted to do with this team. And mm. you can have the highest hopes and the best laid plans like anything, but the reality of what you have on the ground, even given this incredible generation that we've talked about, it required for him at times to recognize that this team may not be as romantic and beautiful as you envisioned it. And that's okay. It doesn't say anything about you, Greg. It doesn't say necessarily anything about the team other than some of the best coaches in the world are able to take a step back, recognize that while I may want to go to this mountain, um, maybe it's better that I go to this mountain. Or maybe we'll still go to the same mountain, but the path I chose initially is going to have to change and I'm going to have to deviate in order to get to the same place that I want to be. And so I, I think that's what it is. I mean, as far as him from a social perspective, he's got a wry sense of humor. He doesn't suffer fools in that. I think what he hasn't lost his a steadfast belief in what he is doing and that he can be successful. I also don't think he was prepared for the criticism and the sting of that criticism out there and maybe needed to kind of go through a couple of years of recognizing that and maybe building up his skin. Um, and in this day and age, we all know it, there's those platforms out there and there is an amplification of, of what happens out there. And again, just like we talked about earlier, sometimes you can make a mountain out of a mole and sometimes you can, because it's amplified, think that that represents everybody and you can even if, if you're not strong you can start to doubt yourself and i'm that probably happened so he's grown just like the players have grown and he's grown with them i think he's gotten better but to a lot of people maybe even you guys he's still not at the level that you want him to be and i think the the more worrying thing for you and others i don't want to speak for you is that he will never be at that level yeah i mean i think the difficult thing even though he has made some adjustments. I actually really liked the whole rain of dropping deeper and during the Mexico game. Other people hated it because they wanted him further up the field. I was like, hey, whatever you can do to get this guy more touches is the better. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, there are going to be people who disagree with me on that completely and said I was completely wrong. And, you know, Greg still got it wrong. And I was like, well, this is actually one time Greg got it. In my opinion, he got it right. But I think for the I, I think the, the the noticeable difference for a lot of people is when Greg left and then we had yep. Hud, Hudson and BJ. Mm -hmm. 
right? And and we saw a different side of this team, and even the players said it, Pepe notably the most, that under BJ and Hudson, he had more freedom and more ability to be creative, i.e. less joysticked, less system, and uh, less positional play. Less, not still positional play, obviously, but less of it. The ability to be more creative. And what I often feel when I watch the games, this is a feeling, but it's also something I see because I can predict our, our we are very predictable. Our play is predictable um, sometimes. And I'll be able to, we were calling a game live and I was able to actually tell you exactly where every pass was going to go for the next six passes. And that's not good. Um, because after a while, you just end up kicking around the box um, in a shoehorn shape and going backwards I thought and he was sideways. A few seconds ahead of me, but he was actually two seconds behind me. Yeah, I mean, that well in advance. I mean, he was like, whoa. Yeah, so the predictability of play has been um, irritating in, at times, and I think the joysticking looked like it disappeared a bit, not disappeared completely. Positional play was still happening, but uh, it looked better amazingly under BJ and Hudson. Am I wrong there? What am I saying that's wrong? I don't know. I think it's a, I think it is a little apples and oranges in terms of what was happening there. And and if you're if your argument involves Pepe, right? The guy that wasn't taken to the World Cup. Well, sure. Uh, you know. They've been a little and, jaded. And, yeah. And and look, he's he, I think he has moved on. I think he's gotten better and I do think he will be in the mix for a number of reasons, not the least of which is that number 9 position still is wide open. I yeah. Mean, Balogun is yet to really take it over in the way that a lot of us thought he was going to and you know that's that's I don't know if that's good or bad, but it's still kind of wide open and as Pepe and others start to get better and to grow, I think there will be a real competition going forward. I am interested in in, in what you perceive, um, and, and it may indeed be the reality, because I, from a, you know, from a playing standpoint, and you guys have played, so the... Not at uh, your level, but yeah. No, but it doesn't, it doesn't matter. It doesn't, honestly, it doesn't matter. We've all had coaches, though. Mm -hmm. This This concept of being hampered and being held back of doing the things that you want to do. I'm just curious how how that manifests. I, I mean, we're talking about this in the national team uh, context, right? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, do you think that there are players out there that want to do something on the field, but they know because they have been told that they aren't allowed to do it and therefore they don't do it? And, and what exactly is that? Is that, I'd like to take this player on right now, but I know that Greg's going to yell at me if I do that? I mean, what, what, what really really happens because i i don't see it but you know maybe i'm missing th something well i i would reference eric williamson i would reference joe scally if i had okay. to joe scally is the one that came to my mind because he he flat out said that the problem with it is that he's constantly thinking you have to think two three four plays in advance in, in the system within you're the thinking system that, itself, you're thinking yeah. that you're thinking too far well if he's going here i've got to go here then you're prone to make mistakes or you're not prone to do what you normally would do um, it, I'm not, I don't think I don't think necessarily think Greg's saying you guys can't be creative with the ball and go into the attack, but there is absolutely a consistent game plan of getting it wide, bringing it around, look for that cross. And I think with the introduction under BJ and under Hudson, mind you, I will say under Hudson initially, because once BJ got there, you slowly started seeing something change with how Reina was being utilized. And the fact that even BJ came out and said, hey, we're, we're going to need Reina to do more defensive uh, responsibilities, more play more as an eight rather than a straight out 10. And it just seems like it's slowly but surely going back to that 4 3 3 that we used to see early, especially earlier on with Greg. Maybe not necessarily World Cup ish, but still that 4 3 3 rather than the 4 2 3 1. So, yeah, I just, I, I have just found that when you get on the field, as, as much as we talk about coaches and managers out there and their importance, and I'm not saying that they, that they can't orchestrate and can't be architects behind the scenes, but maybe more so than any sport out there. I think when that whistle blows, it's about the players. And I, I, I don't see someone like Gio Reyna or someone like Pulisic. And yes, there are peripherally players that come in that may be in a state of awe and shock because it's a very, very different team, obviously very, very different circumstances, but I don't see the majority of the players when they get out there on the national team that they are being, again, held back from doing what they want to do. Once that whistle blows and you do things, you you do them. 
and there is a flow and there is an understanding that every player knows and feels. And that's not to say that there isn't a strategy and that's not to say that there isn't a there aren't tactics that are used and that the team has bought into or at least uh, whether they bought into or not is a question. But at least mm -hmm. they all know what they are trying to do. But there's probably no sport more. Uh, I would agree with more you. Autonomous. Like, yeah. I would agree with you in our day and age. I think that was absolutely true. But we have moved into an era mm -hmm. um, where pep ball, for instance, is glorified. And that is a much more joysticked. Um, it's a, I'm not saying it's absolutely constraining. No, I'm not saying that. I'm not saying everybody's butts all puckered up out there. I think there's still a level of creativity, obviously, Man City's an amazing team. And even Pep says, well, in the final third, uh, there are no tactics. It's just about creativity. They do what they got to do. Try his accent. That's lazy no, I'm not going to try his accent. <laughs> so, so, um, so I'm not saying that the level of constraint is to the point where these guys are totally puckered up on the field, but it does seem somewhat stifling and constraining at times especially if I can predict every single pass three steps ahead because I know where every ball is going to go. And I do think that level has changed in the game since we played it to now. I think there is yeah. more control. In fact, the coach, of, I can't remember what manager it was, the World Cup said, um, Greg's got his team to play like a club team. In, Holland. And I've never yeah. seen that happen at a World Cup. I guess he wasn't clapping it. He's just astonished by it. So... Uh, there's yeah, I just too. I would love to get them in a room, all the players, and ask them if you feel stifled, and then if you do, at what moments, like what, what, what are you not doing, or what are you doing that you don't feel comfortable doing, and that you would want to do differently out, out there on the field? And look, everybody's going to have little little things like you know, I. I don't like playing inverted wingers or I don't like a player that overlaps. You know, when we used to play with Kobe Jones, he was so good out wide that we all knew and this was not taught to us, by the way, <laughs> mm -hmm. we all knew that when Kobe got the ball out wide, you know, even nowadays or, or even in back in the day, you know, the, an overlapping run, whether it's from an outside back or whether it's from a midfielder, whether and that's the kind of a part and parcel type of thing. You do it and you draw a defender and you confuse the defense. Nobody went <coughs> out there because we knew that Kobe Jones, okay, one-on-one -on -one or even one-on-two, nine out of 10 times, he's going to beat the guy and there's a cross going. Now, nobody had to tell us that. That wasn't strategic. That wasn't tactical. We just, we knew that. And if Steve Sampson or if Boro Vilchurch had told us, no, I want an overlap, all that kind of stuff. Maybe and maybe it's generational. We would have said no. That's that's not what we're that's not what we're doing. In that sense, that would be a perfect example in my scenario where I'm bringing everybody in and said, well, I don't think that we should overlap when Kobe Jones has the ball out there. And I would right. be interested if we and we'll never get this opportunity. But if the players were in that room, what they would tell us or what they would tell Greg is like, this is what I think I can be better, and I think we can be better by doing this. And this is the constraints that you have put on me and us in this moment that keeps me from doing that. And that irritates me and irks. And it's so much so that you don't have the fortitude and the belief to still do it out there on the field. And maybe that's a, a, not a problem, but maybe that's the reality of the way that they view the coach, the way they view the manager. And a lot of these guys, as we said, have started when they were very, very young. And so they have that very yeah. close relationship of, yeah. hey, this is the guy that brought yeah. me to the mount, and I'm going to follow what he says. And that's what it looks like to me, honestly. Mm -hmm. Wallace, I, I, Alexi. Yeah. God, why do I keep calling you Wallace? Alexi, I, I, it, it is what it looks like to me um, that there are things. Uh, just an example. Um, how far up when we have possession, Jedi's pushed up the left side? That just doesn't make any sense because then when he's receiving the ball, he's totally crunched. He's got two guys around. So this is very intentional, though, because then you have Reina covering behind him. All this is so very intentional in such a geometric way. 
uh, when I rewatched it and rewatched it again, and uh, maybe I'm doing too much rewatching. Maybe that's the problem. <laughs> all right. But it, it, it looks so intentional and it does look a little stifling to me. And we were watching an old uh, uh, interview um, with Roy Keane and uh, Jamie Carragher. And I can't remember who else it was, but, um, and they're like, yeah, you know, think about tactics today and the way we talk about tactics. You remember Fergie? He never talked about tactics. I mean, there were basic things like if one midfielder goes forward, one covers, you know, if the left back goes forward, you know, one back stays back. It was very basic. He, there were no real tactical explanations of where you need to be on the field, what triangles to form. You know, it was very free flow. And that's why I'm saying I do think the game has changed. Alexi, I really do. I don't oh, think I know. I, I would agree. Absolutely. It has. And, you know, the managers and the coaches, they 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 have the opportunity to and they do imprint themselves in a much greater way. And, and who knows? I mean, you're talking about Roy Keane. He's not going to listen to anybody. Right. So he's going to do what he's going to do. And even in that there is an art and a skill to what sir alex and others are doing so you can say that you know bruce arena used to get this all the time he's not a tactical guy he's not xs knows well that doesn't mean that you're not an incredible coach that doesn't mean that you aren't incredible in terms of putting the players in the position to succeed understanding who they are their mentality you know knowing when to pat them on the back and knowing when to kick them in the ass all that kind of stuff is important and it doesn't hurt when you're a sir alex and you got the best players in the world that you're able to right. throw out throw out there on the field and most coaches will tell you that the tactical part of the game gets less and less as you get into the final third. And then you're reliant on the individual skill that you have and, you know, the creativity and the feel that these players have for what is what is uh, what is ending up happening. But in your in your scenario and in your example that you gave, when Jedi is pushed up there, um, it's, you know, presumably to get him as close to the opposition goal as possible to utilize the fact that he can be, you know, a very good weapon on that left-hand side. But I also hear you saying, yeah, he's a weapon, but if you give him an extra 10 or 20 yards back running into that space, maybe yep. you get a much more efficient and therefore much more effective type of, of run out there. And that's completely valid. Well, yeah, especially if you watch the Fulham games where Jedi is the most effective is a switch fields pass to him out wide um, with, 20 yards in front of open space mm -hmm. because the defense hasn't shifted over to cover that spot, but that's not what we do. And uh, I don't know. I, I don't want to get yeah, into the weeds of it, but you know, that's part of what we're doing here. Sure. But, yeah. And so, similar to that point though, is, is uh, to answer your question earlier, as far as you know, what players would say, what I think if there's one position that would absolutely feel stifled by the system and by how, they're being asked to play. I think the the nine absolutely is is being crushed now. Mind you, less this cycle because you started implementing more of a a creative midfielder mind. Whether it's Tillman or Geo in there, that's going to unlock some channels. But in, in especially in the last cycle and some Prior. of the more recent games and stuff of this cycle, you you start you start seeing the striker being pigeonholed as as one type of striker. So you have you have a you have a, a play with your back to the goal. You have to check back. I mean, this it, it, it works well for Sargent because he's not going to – unfortunately, the nine doesn't really score that many goals in our team. They do score some in some games, but not all the time. We have other weapons. But the game that Berhalter is playing out there just does not seem to work for the most part. Not for Balogun. For our nines. Doesn't, definitely doesn't work for Balogun because he's a different type of striker than both Pepe and Sargent for that matter. And quite frankly, looking at somebody like Peacock, who's who would be a completely different striker than all all the other three. I'm about I mean, closer just, to Sergeant. Though. Yeah. So it's just, I would say if there's one, if there's if there's one position you want to isolate down to say that the players may sit there and say, well, this isn't working for us. It's going to be the nine. Yeah, that's my opinion. And and I will say, you know, I remember the first game that we did uh, when uh, Burhalter took over years ago and they got their ass kicked by uh, brazil and mm -hmm. that was like the most romantic type you know one of my favorite scenes in movies is in um tin cup where he just continues to hit the ball uh i don't know if you remember this movie I love it yes right so because i think it says so much about being romantic and versus being pragmatic and all that and there is a romance to going down in flames and dying on that hill mm -hmm. and in that moment, 
Greg Berhalter was a true believer, but he has changed since then. I think he'd be the first person to admit that what he wanted in that moment, and obviously didn't happen, you know, has changed dramatically in the way that he uh, that he looks at it, that, he lo that he looks at this team. And I think that he can, I think that he can further change. And I think he is going to look, if he makes it to 2026, very, very different than certainly the the, the coach that took over two cycles ago, mm. but also different than the coach that we see this summer, if he uh, if he ultimately makes it that far. And that's, I think that's a good thing. I think you want your your coach to to believe in what he or she is doing, but also to be able to say, you know what, this isn't working especially in an international capacity where you have such limited time with the players that you got to, you got to use everything efficiently and you have to pick and choose your moments and how far you want to shoot when you're, uh, when you're, you know, going for the moon or the stars. I hope you're right. I hope he does evolve. I have obviously when he came back, we were seeing a different formation at times. We're seeing the four, two, three, mm -hmm. one. That is an evolution. There is a realization that Reina needs to start. Um, you know, didn't start the first game in this last window, but that's okay. He he knows who Reina is, and he knows how important he is. So this is good. These are good things. These are evolutions. Okay. I think. So so if we're playing if we're playing our first World Cup game tomorrow, all right, everybody is healthy, all right. So who who is starting? Because you know th there's going to be some good players that don't make it on the field. Exactly. So, mm -hmm. so you know now everybody's healthy. I know we just talked about Musa, right? Mm -hmm. And I and I get I get it. You're playing. You know, it, it could be competition and stuff like that. But sure. let's let's just say, hey, let's just say we're playing the, the Netherlands again in a, a group 16 game. All right. Are you still starting with Musa, uh, Tyler and uh, uh, Weston. and Weston in that uh, three in the middle? No. no. OK, so who's out? Musa? Musa. So. All right. So Musa out now. All right. So now you've already said this is going to be a more attacking type of lineup, right? Because I'm, I'm assuming you're putting Gio Reina in there, right? Yep. Yeah, but but Gio's shown he can play some defense. He, he can, but he's a very different player than Musa, sure. without a doubt. And so yep. the complexion of the game dramatically changes uh, changes there. Um, are you playing Weya and Pulisic on each side? Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. What up? Uh, are you going with Balogun, or what are you doing up top? Sergeant. Ooh, Sergeant. Yeah. Okay, yeah. It's, I, it's, I, it sucks that he wasn't around for the last yeah. window. I really wish we could have seen him, but. Yep. Yeah, I'm probably going Sergeant as well, or, well, I would have up until just recently because i don't know what the hell's going on with peppy but yeah sergeant i think and peppy fit greg's profile mm -hmm. better his system better than does balgun balgun yeah, would be better, better as a winger but, honestly in greg's peppy system. fits greg's profile well, so what about like uh brandon vasquez no he would fit sure. it better than balgun as well even though okay. Okay. he's yeah. like third in line behind sergeant and even he's okay. probably behind or equal to pfock at this point but he's certainly behind peppy and sergeant i did this one saying that uh, that not all, obviously not all strikers fit the same mold. And the problem is, is regardless of who we play in there, in that system, that nine still is required to play a very specific role. Now yep. with Geo as more of an offensive minded, like 10 slash eight, where he's not necessarily required to cover back so much. And you probably get that with Tyler Adams than with Musa, because Tyler's going to sit further back, he's generally destroyer, speaking. Destroyer, yeah. So you have that ability where you can play that. And then if, if Geo has that freedom to roam in that, that, that attacking style, then yeah, flow would work well. And flow even mentioned that at the very beginning of uh, the cycle that you know, um, Geo. You know, I really like playing with Geo because he op he opens the doors for those through balls. His bread and butter is making those runs. Yeah, not necessarily playing with his back to back to the goal. You know, holding up the play and stuff like that. And you see you see him struggling with that at the national team level. Whereas somebody like Pepe and Sargent can do that. They may lack certain aspects that flow has. But it, you, you have to kind of pick and choose at the point. Yeah, but I think well, the good, especially when you talk about Reina, yeah, yeah, you lose something from a defensive perspective. It's not that you can't play defense, but you lose something. But I think the the good far outweighs the bad about the possibility of those creative moments that we've talked about coming to fruition, and you know, ultimately being the difference uh, when you're scoring a goal, or you're not scoring a goal, or when you're winning that round of sixteen game, or you're uh, or you're not uh, going forward. So okay, I I. I'm I'm there with you too, and I think going forward we're going to see a lot. And you know, again, going back to the situation, I, I think they want to move on. I think it will always be part of the story. It will always be part of the dynamic. But I do think that everybody has kind of moved on, and that he's playing is great. It'll be interesting if and when Reina is not playing mm -hmm. well, mm -hmm. and the dynamic 
and the decision making process when it comes to uh, Greg Berhalter because of that baggage and because of that history going forward. But so far, so good. And, you know, maybe Reina, God, I just I kind of want him to get done with this forest thing and get to the <laughs> summer. And if he's going to make if he's going to make a move, fine, if he's going to continue on, whatever, but just kind of get this done. And then then hopefully we'll be cooking. So at least he started. Go ahead, Brett. Yeah, he did. Yep. I didn't mean to cut you off again, Derek, but just real quick. Derek kind of uh, made the comment uh, as Flo possibly playing more of a winger role in Greg's system. What do you think about that? Yeah, I mean, so while Wea, I think, has been our bright, shining light, he has tailed off a little bit. And, I, mm-hmm. and again, there are no sacred cows out there. So if you put him out there uh, on the right-hand side, and by the way, there's potential to move all sorts of people around, you know, cause he can go back to right back. And so, you know, that flexibility is good. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't think anything is set in stone when it comes to this lineup other than Weston, um, Pulisic, you know, t- Tyler, if he's healthy, but let's just say Tyler in terms of finding a place there, uh, there sure. on the field. Right. And I think, uh, and, and probably Dest on that right hand uh, side. And I think there's nobody yet uh, that's taken Matt Turner's spot. So I think those are the, mm-hmm. those are the you know the uh, the ones that are in pen. And then everything else is up for grab. Not that those other guys can't be, you know, taken out, but it would it would take something. Sure. Yep. Uh, this is AJ one four one zero ma 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 for one ninety nine. Lexi, thoughts on the ten position? Is it dying? Oh God! Well, I, I'm so bad at the positions with the numbers. So you got because you know the def- definitions have changed and morphed over <laughs> the years. They so certainly have attacking atta- mid, yeah. right? attacking like an attacking mid, midfielder. Yeah. Has yeah. it is it dying? Um, I think the way that we kind of look at it and the names that we attach to it over history, that version of it certainly is dying. And I think it's logical progression. We've talked a little bit about how the game has changed, how coaching has changed, and therefore the expectations of the players from a physical perspective and an offense to defense type of thing. You know, although you're, you, if you watch Messi, I mean, he's, he's done when they don't have the ball, sure. but yeah. he's messy too. And you got other guys that say, yeah. fine, if I'm going to work my I'll ass off load, yeah. and double, right, I'll do it for him because of what I get on the other side. Um, but yeah, I think, I, I think the 10, if you're, if you're asking me if the position of a guy or girl that runs the show is is over or dying i guess it's it's not dying but it's changing a little bit and you know maybe it's just cyclical maybe maybe it'll come back around and the interesting thing <coughs> certainly from an american perspective i mean we haven't had really one uh in the past that's a that's a true 10 and certainly right. not one that's comparable to other teams um so Maybe it's not dying. Maybe it's being born in that hopefully there's somebody that come along <laughs> that can do the things that in MLS we often attribute to that 10 position. But more often than not, not more often than not, almost entirely, it is foreign based players that are in that 10 position. And, you know, listen, you don't you can be the field general as a Redri, Re, Redri, registry registry. Uh, what's the Italian Regista? word? Regista. Thank you. Like, I mean, that's a more deep line, um, like almost really a six, eight, but nowadays, yes, most tens are expected to be an eight as well. I mean, on defense, you're an eight, but on offense, you're a 10. I mean, yeah, I don't know about it Mm. disappearing, but it's certainly changed. Yeah. Changing. Soccer dad in Cali says for $10. Thank you, my friend. Wow. $10. That's nice. We had a hundred. We had a, we had $99 one the other show. It's unreal. Yeah. yeah, great, great show, guys. Great discussion. Thank you, soccer. Oh, thank um, you. dad and Kelly. I, I, I want to before we leave, maybe we're not leaving, Greg. I don't know. That's up to Brett. But w- one thing I, I wanted to bring up, and it is something that we brought up when US Soccer publishes these behind the scenes videos and what do they call it? Beyond behind the crest. And sense. um okay, there are two a cu- couple disturbing ones, and I, I maybe you can work these out for us but the one of them was um the uh african dogs dogs. that that was like whole team looked pretty uncomfortable with that chant um and then the more recent one where he says um he says boom and the slide comes up and it says we're going to change the way the slide says we're going to change the way americans feel about 
American soccer. And then he said, who's up for that? Raise your hands. And everybody looked really uncomfortable. They kind of did one of these things like, eh, me, me, I do. Um, some of that, I think, shouldn't be published. Or maybe is it okay that it's published? But it doesn't reflect well uh, on Greg as a leader. I think it's really uncomfortable to watch for me. Seems really uncomfortable for the players. Their answers to his questions seem rather uncomfortable too. Um, is this this awkwardness that we were talking about before yeah. with Greg? Is this he's just not a natural leader? He's doing his best to be one, but it's just he's no Bruce Arena. Sure. Right. Let's just sure. put it that way. And it's you know it's. It's the content versus the performance, right? And, you know, um, who was it? Uh, who was it? The Saudi uh, goalkeeper, uh, Rene, uh, 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 Hervé Renard or whatever. Um, there you go. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Uh, you know, when that, when that whole locker room thing came out, uh, you know, when these things happen, you know, these, these TED Talks or <laughs> on steroid <laughs> types of things that happen. <laughs> Like I, I roll my eyes because I know that half the time you're just trying to get liquids and you're trying to take a piss and you're whatever. And it yeah. goes in one ear and out the other. And I'm not saying that you can't be motivated. And I'm not saying that whether it's videos or whether it's a human being can't press a button um, with by the way, not just by what they say, but maybe even more importantly, the way that they say it. But a lot of it nowadays is performative. It is for the gram. It is for social media. It is for the public. And if you have somebody who is not accustomed to doing it, or more importantly, is just uh, not good at doing it, it's never going to hit. Uh, and certainly it's not going to hit from a public perspective, okay? Yeah, that hurts. <clears throat> so... Yeah, I mean, you, you you take the good, you know, the best that you possibly can get. And I'm sure it's on a case by case basis. I will say that, that whether it's Greg or the players nowadays, they all know that pretty much everything they do or say is being recorded and clipped <laughs> and could end up being viral. And so I don't think that we get true, authentic, genuine versions of the players. And so a lot of the stuff that they do is performative. And that's okay because it is, and that's part of what this visual world is that we live in. Um, you know, this, 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 this moment. So would it have been better if we have no context and no peek into what's happening behind the scenes and therefore into, you know, Greg's personality? Yeah. I just think that he's not real comfortable doing it and he's gotten a whole lot better. Let me tell you. And I, know, I just don't think he is ever going to be the big, bold, gregarious, colorful type of personality that is Pep, that is uh, Jose Mourinho, that's Bruce Arena, you know, th these types of players. And so, uh, you know, I, I, I agree with you in that why, don't try to be something that you're not, but it doesn't mean that you can't be motivational. It doesn't mean that you can't get better at the public facing part of it. Yeah, I mean, if Bruce did that, if Bruce, but first of all, Bruce probably wouldn't have used a slogan like that in the first place. No. And I don't think slogans <laughs> like Bruce would have like pissed on that slogan. First of all, he would have not even embraced anything. But if, if Bruce did put up a slide like that, he would say, who here wants to change American soccer? Raise your hands. No, just kidding. Put your hands down. I'm joking around. Of course, we all want to change American soccer and the way Americans view it. You know, it would be, but that would have been a better look because it would have shown, shown a sense of humor, etc. It just, it was painful. That's all. Well, well, okay. So the performance is one thing, and then there's the actual content. And so what he was saying, if said by somebody else or said in a different way by him might have a much more dramatic and positive type of impact. You know, I, again, I love people that are big, bold, and arrogant in the things that they do and the things that they say. And look, whether it's, you know, leaders or people that have accomplished anything, they have done things that people didn't believe could be done. And so, you know, this call to arms, I actually, I, I, I like it because it is fundamentally what, you want to do. And if you were to be successful in 2026, to an extent that we haven't seen before, 
that's what you would accomplish. And so saying it out loud to the players and then by putting it out there to the public, you're hoping to manifest it, right? Uh, and I, I, I like that. I like that you want to go to that, that mountain. How we're going to get there, you know, we're going to have to figure it out along the way. But too many people say, I, I don't want to go to that mountain or I don't, I, I don't want to say it out loud where I'm going. You know, the, the Project 2010 or whatever, people laugh about that. No, I, I love it. Even if you fail, I would rather have somebody with a flawed plan than no plan at all. I am going to follow the person that has a plan and that has conviction in that plan, even though it might be flawed and even though it has the risk of failing. Because the alternative is to just meander and to not have any sense of direction and to have no ultimate leadership when it comes to where we're going and certainly no confidence as to where we're going. I agree with all that. I would just say this. A mission statement needs to be somewhat measurable. And I don't know how you measure. It's like we're going to change the way the rest of the world views American soccer. I don't know if we have a conclusive view on whether that happened after the World Cup, or is that even, is the World Cup where that's going to happen? Or are individual players at their clubs changing the way the rest of the world views American soccer? It's nothing to do with the World Cup and Greg Berhalter and U.S. soccer. It's about the fact that we got players playing in the best teams in top five leagues in Europe that's changing the view. So to me, making a mission statement, listen, I'm being an old school guy here who used to help and, and, uh, to consulting with companies, God help me, um, about building a common mission, vision, values, goals. One of the things you don't do, like a school saying, oh, we want to create great citizens. I used to consult schools. I said, well, how do you know you've done that? Do you call them 20 years later and say, um, are you a good citizen? Do you have a job? Do you have kids? Do you own a car? How? You, there's no way of measuring that. So my that's my big problem with that statement, and maybe that's being me being too critical. But I, I just it annoys me. A I'll, be, I'll be honest. I don't I don't care what the rest of the world thinks. You know, I don't I, either. I care. I, I really care what, don't. I, I care what my country thinks. Me but too. if the U.S. went out and won the men's World Cup in 2026, the country would think immediately differently about what we are as a soccer playing nation. And absolutely the world would think, is it, is it a panacea? Is it uh, the immediate change and credibility of everything that we do and a justification uh, and, a, uh, and a pathway to um, the riches and the opportunities? Not necessarily, but it does fundamentally <laughs> change the way that you think about yourself and I think the way that the world would think about it. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Sparks would fly out of my ass. Stuff would start happening yeah, to me yeah. uncontrollably physically that I wouldn't know how to understand or deal with. If we won, I mean, I nearly had a cardiac arrest when we won the Confederations Cup. I can't even imagine what would happen if we won or got close to winning a 2026. I'm not even 100% positive that the world's mindset of our of us as a footballing nation would actually change if we won the uh, world cup i suspect there'd be a lot oh. of uh, a lot of coping in the sense that you would be like ah they had an easier path there they almost lost this team over here no. a, lot of, a lot of excuses i don't you, know if it changed. they would make excuses but that's undeniable I'm I, don't, sorry. I think it would change it would definitely change your state side well, well, I think more interest would draw into it. So it would change my bodily hey, bodily function. We should be so lucky to find out. <laughs> right? <laughs> For sure. We, we had talked we had talked about like the, the we we're talking about the mission statements, but you also talked about uh some of the behind the crest stuff and it's cringe, some of it's cringe. And uh like so you had talked about how well if somebody else had said it, maybe it'd be taken a bit differently. And I always I always whenever I talk about we think about like the halftime talkings that you see like in the uh behind the crest, I always think of Always go back to the uh, um, the Jesse Marsh at Salzburg uh, halftime. Was I was uh, uh, was it a Champions League match swearing in German? Yeah, yeah. It was yeah. like it was a mix between uh, speaking English and then going to German, back to English and then to German. And I, I don't even think that he could make the African dogs comment work. No, no, he couldn't either. I don't think there's They're... any way of making that work. No. I think it's I think it's hard, man. I think <laughs> we're so jaded and cynical as a as a people, as a as a human race right sure. now. I think it's hard for any coach <laughs> in any sport, you know, and, and we have so much of a library of of moments and, and Hollywood-esque type of things that we all know are are fabricated and aren't necessarily true. And again, it's not so I think I think the motivation ultimately ends up happening much more individually. And maybe it's 
organic. It can be planned, but mm -hmm. it it happens it happens one on one as opposed to in a in a group setting. And yep. um, and I think in particular maybe soccer. I, I'll give you this this story before we go here. Um, my son played uh, American football for the first time this year, and. Mm. I, I have no context. I, I don't follow football. I don't, I've never played it or anything like that. And it was so interesting to go through a season and to be around high school football and to see how completely different the dynamic is in that sport. And you talk about like Ted talks and rah, rah and <laughs> testosterone flying around in like the most stereotypical way. And all of these visions um, and, uh, the way that I thought about uh, uh, football like came to be. And it's like, oh my God, it's all there. It's, it's, it, this is actually what they do. Mm. And it was an amazing, uh, it was amazing journey from, for me on the outside to see what it is, what it is about. Cause I know how different soccer is. And maybe there's the international aspect of it. And maybe there's the, from an American perspective, the fact that we have not been King and we have kind of had to, make our own way and create our own history, obviously, and, and, and our own, um, even our own like mythology and folklore and everything like that. But it's just so, so different. And I, I don't want to be jaded and I don't want to be cynical because I can be moved and I can be motivated by human beings and through soccer and other things, but th certainly through soccer. But I think it's, it's gotten harder and harder to do. And maybe it's even harder when it comes to soccer. Yeah. No, I mean, you're right. And then I think it's, as you said before, it comes more naturally to others. Bruce Arena, great example. I know we're going to forever crucify Bruce because he didn't get us to the 2018. But listen, maybe I'm old school, but that guy, even when I interviewed him 20 years ago, never lied to me. I never felt like he lied to me. He just told me he didn't suffer fools either, by the way. Oh, but yeah. he, he, But he did it in his own way. And you knew. Um, but there was never a threat. He just let you know that was a dumb question. And then he let you know how, and that was okay. I mean, that's something you can, you can live through that and learn through that. But if you don't get a real answer at all, it's kind of hard to learn. And then you just end up getting banned by U.S. soccer for future interviews. Uh, but anyhow, that is what it is. Um, I know you probably got to go here soon, Alexi. Yeah, I got to go. I got to go eat. <laughs> Yeah, no. You have, you, have, you have two seconds. I got two super chats with your name. Oh, yeah, right yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't worry. All right. Yeah. Two super chats. Here we go. Yeah. AJ1410. One ninety nine. Alexi, will there ever be another Ozil? Oh, Metzid Ozil. Yeah. I mean, a lot of Germans hope not. <laughs> well, I, I mean, considering what, what Germany has been uh, yeah. over the last couple of cycles, <laughs> although I think they're a sleeping giant for this summer. So, um, you know, and, and we're going to be following them very closely this summer when it comes uh, when it comes to the Euros and obviously hosting. And we've seen what Germany can do when they host a tournament, both in terms of being hosts and the excitement that they can generate, but also on the field, what they can do. I, I think it goes back also to what we were talking about with the 10 and these creative, a lot of times diminutive type of players in that, yeah, I, I I think from a German perspective, he was an outlier, um, yeah. and he was a a different type of player, which made him so attractive and so interesting because he was, for lack of a better phrase, like like anti-German in the way that he played, and yet he came to represent what Germany was in that era and in that time. So that's mm -hmm. a long way of saying. I think they broke the mold when it came, when it when it, came, when it comes to what he was, and he was like a shooting star in that you know it, it was never destined to last for uh, for very long. But the moments that we had and the magic that we had, man, oh man! So I yeah I I yeah I can't see another Metsud Ozil coming coming through, but you never know. The world's changing. Germany certainly is changing, and the opportunity is there and they still will have an incredible Germany. I'm talking about, uh, we'll have an incredible history to draw on, but man, oh man, what a player. Mm -hmm. Yeah. As a German American, it's been tough to watch. Um, Brad Pen but like you said, maybe there's hope and I hope there is. It's my second team, Brad Pendleton, uh, for four 99, no real jingle to go along with that. Brad Pendleton four 99, uh, Alexi, you are the king of USSF. 
we finish second in the group behind Uruguay and then lose first knockout game in Copa. Do you sack Greg? Ooh. I mean, that that could be a game against uh, Brazil, by the way, which is the way yes. that it all works up. So, you know, I'm hesitant to say, you know, hey, losing to Brazil, there's no shame in that. But this is what you were hired for, okay? To get us to, I'm not going to say the promised land, but get, get us to a consistent po point where we are competing with the best in the world. Not always beating them, but we are competing with the elites out there because we've been fine at being in that 10 to 20 range. Now we want to consistently be in that top 10 range. And when we come up against a team like the Netherlands, or in this case, in your example, Brad, coming up against a Brazil, it's no longer good enough to have moral victories. So yeah, if, if I felt that not only was it, uh, was it a loss, but it was a bad loss hmm. and it was a loss that was avoidable in terms of the mistakes that were made and the mistakes that were made were correctable and were not to be expected this far along in the process. Absolutely. I think, I think he has to do something special and although it's not his fault because of the reality of COVID and everything that's, that's gone on, he still does not have that signature win. And I hope he gets it because a win like that, that would be a signature type of win. And at the very least, if the team were to lose a game against Brazil, you want everybody coming out saying, man, you know, we lost because somebody did something incredible that nobody's ever going to stop. Somebody hit a banger from far out or somebody dribbled through three people or whatever, and we were in the game from start to finish. And if nobody knew who these two teams were and came down from, uh, you know, a Martian came down and looked at them, <laughs> they would say that very little separates these two teams. And there's not a lot of times in history where we've been able to say that relative from to the U S relative to Brazil. So, yeah. Yeah, I know. Well, I couldn't have said that any better, actually, that that was well put, which just brings me back to the fact that, We've just been agreeing a whole lot lately. Alexia. Hey, give, it, it'll, give it time; it'll change. It'll change. Nothing can happen if it does. Come on. I'm not doing. I'm not doing my job if this continues. <laughs> I don't know what's wrong. Something's wrong here. You're either, uh, you know, we're both right, or somebody's lost a screw. Either way, I want to appreciate. I want. I appreciate you coming on the show. I want to thank you for coming on. This is. It's been a lot of fun. A little stressful preparing for it on short, short notice. When you're like, "Yeah, let's do it today," I'm like, "Oh shit, is this a test?" <laughs> no okay. i mean listen i like like i said before uh you know this this all happened within a day as you mentioned and right. i'm glad that it did i'm glad that Me i got too. to hang out with you guys this is this is fun this is what i love to do to be quite honest i, I don't get to do this often enough um it usually happens when i'm traveling around and you know the, the travel situation especially over the last years with covid and all that kind of stuff has changed dramatically but i love when i get to talk to people and this is the next best thing uh in terms of what we're doing and as i tell people all the time you know when, when i when i do these things uh, first off it's great just to hang and to meet new friends and uh, and to uh and to talk about the game and to talk about life and all the different things whether we agree or disagree as we established early on but yeah. you know a lot of us that kick the ball get a lot of credit and a lot of uh, attention um but everybody men and women on and off the field multi-generational now that have worked so hard to bring the game to where it is right now and we're not done we got great things to look forward to and whether it's you brett or whether it's you Derek, you know what you're doing in the greater scheme of things, you might look at it and not think that it's important. It is important and it's wonderful. And I know that, you know, plenty of people that, that watch you and follow you, you know, appreciate this type of conversation. And don't let anybody tell you that America is not a soccer nation. Don't let anybody mm -hmm. tell you that Americans, when it comes to soccer, aren't passionate, aren't discerning, uh, don't love the game, uh, and don't ever, ever apologize <laughs> for what people will say you are or you aren't as an American soccer fan. I, I love this community so much uh, because of the way that it stands up, because of the way that it wears its soccer on its sleeve, even in our strange and unique fashion that is soccer. It, it's, I think, what makes it special. 
especially yeah. around the world. And it needs to be celebrated and it needs to be protected and it needs to be owned. And people like you and people that watch this show uh, are part of that army and part of that community. It keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And that tent that we talk about, it has room for so many more people. And you guys are doing a great job of making that tent bigger. So thank mm -hmm. you for having me on. It was a real pleasure. I'll go watch the uh, the, the, uh, no, the viral thing right now. No, <laughs> don't, don't go watch that. Just ask Stu. He'll tell you, he'll sum it up for you, but don't watch it. It makes me look like a raving lunatic. Um, hey, thanks for coming on. Hey, we got to have you on again because I want to yeah. talk about music as well. Cool. I, I'm the guy that had the album that came out, by the way, that people are all saying, Oh yeah, you know, Alexi's a better musician. I said, well, Alexi probably is a better musician, but I think I'm a better writer, blah, blah, blah. And then, you know, you were nice enough to thank me or, or you know, I guess congratulate me on an album that came out when actually all the music was recorded back in 2005, but it came out on record, which is anything on vinyl. is just That's amazing. awesome. That's awesome. Yeah, hey, you anybody doing that. something creative, you know, I mean, if you're, if, if you're going to dump on somebody for doing something creative, then you got big problems. My friend. I mean, <laughs> exactly. the world needs more creativity. The world does mean, need more romance, whether it's on the soccer field or whether it's music or art or anything out there. I, I, I firmly believe that the, having music in my life has made me a better person. And whether, you know, it's for the three people that actually listen to it, like my mom, well, sometimes my mom and, and, and others out there, uh, <laughs> or, if, or if nobody listens to it, it doesn't matter. It's in your heart and it's in your soul. And I'm glad that you've been able to get it out. Yeah, we got to swap albums. We'll do awesome. that. We'll do that privately. Uh, uh, yeah, Jesse, we're gonna Alexi any stepsister advice. That's an inside joke on the show. Um, he's not going to have any, and that's okay. We want to thank all of you that came out tonight uh, to watch the show. Make sure you like, subscribe, share it with your grandma. And no, if you do need stepsister advice, you are always welcome here. We will answer your questions. Until the next time on the Straight Red Card, thanks to Alexi. Make sure you check out uh, the State of the Union podcast, and we'll be back on Thursday. Good night. <laughs> that hurt. <laughs> <laughs> then what is this thing? Gio should never play for U.S. men's national team again because of the action of his parents. Because what an idiot! Oh, what type of Muppet does this? Muppets. Absolute Muppet.